Hello. I call the February 21st, 2023 City Council regular meeting to order. City Clerk Ben Lane, would you please conduct the roll call? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor David Ortega? Present. Vice Mayor Kathy Littlefield? Present. Thank you. Council members Tammy Caputi? Here. Tom Durham? Here. Barry Graham? Here. Betty Janik? Here. And Solange Whitehead? Here. City Manager Jim Thompson? Here. City Attorney Sherry Scott? Here. City Treasurer Sonia Andrews? Here. Acting City Auditor Leigh Clough? Here. And the clerk is present. Thank you, Mayor. Excellent. Uh, we have with us um, Scottsdale Police Sergeant Sean Ryan and Detective Dustin Patrick, as well as Firefighter uh, Jasmine Powell, if anyone needs assistance. Also, the restrooms are uh, up and to the left at that uh, opening. At this point, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I call upon uh, Councilman Durham. So at this point, um, I do want to uh, call our attention to um, the war in Ukraine and remember that uh, their sacrifice and fight for freedom and democracy is going on. So I'll ask for uh, moments of silence for the people of Ukraine. Thank you. As a reminder, the Scottsdale Arabian Horse Show is in progress there at Westworld. It's amazing. There are 2,400 contestants from all over the world and uh, amazing programs, uh, really a great family time. And it will run through Sunday, uh, February 26th. Also, uh, spring training is back, and we are ready, willing, and able to greet um, uh, other teams as they come to Scottsdale Stadium, uh, the home stadium for the San Francisco Giants. And the um, opening day is Sunday, February 26th. And as I say, play ball, right? That's good. Now, next we will have a presentation by the LG Twins, the Korean Baseball Organization. I'll ask Chris Walsh, a Parks and Recreation Manager, to please come forward. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Chris Walsh, Parks and Recreation Manager. Uh, thank you for allowing me some time to quickly uh, highlight one of our unique international partnerships uh, in the realm of professional baseball. Uh, as we all know, the Valley's home to the Cactus League, and Scottsdale is uh, home to our land's longstanding partners, as you mentioned, Mayor, uh, the San Francisco Giants. Scottsdale's wonderful weather and beautiful city even draws attention from all around the world. In, two, in early 2018, we began discussions with the LG Twins, a Korean professional baseball team on their desire to host spring training right here in Scottsdale. In 2020, we executed a, a, a three-year agreement with two one-year renewals that would allow the LG Twins uh, to utilize the Indian School Park Clubhouse along with two and a half fields. Uh, that agreement came with one year uh, options to renew. Um, the past couple of years obviously has been very challenging with COVID and prevented the team from traveling to our great city for the initial two years of the contract. However, we've continued with perseverance and patience and we finally have them here in Scottsdale. Our department is very pleased with our relationship and proud to host an international partner like the LG Twins. We are currently working toward an extension of their contract and hope to continue this in international ende endeavor. I have with me here tonight from the LG Twins, CEO In Song Kim, General Manager Myung Sok Cha, CFO Ta Jin Jung, and uh, starting pitcher 
Casey Kelly, who also happens to be a resident of Scottsdale. So he really does appreciate getting to spend a little bit extra time with his family in his, in his home here in Scottsdale, where he resides. Uh, I believe they have some jerseys they'd like to present with you and, and maybe a quick photo opportunity. Well, for sure. Um, let's come forward. Thank you. And if you'd all, anybody else would like to come down, there's jerseys for everyone. So we will uh, move on to the agenda items, and I will clarify a couple things. The, um, our City of Scottsdale procedures include um, that during tonight's meeting, the Council may make a motion to recess into executive session to obtain legal advice on any applicable item on the agenda. If authorized by the Council, the executive session will be immediately and uh, will begin immediately and will not be open to the public. If that happens, the public uh, meeting will resume following the executive session. Also, um, I know we have a uh, full house here, but our uh, council rules of procedure uh, say that citizens attending city council meetings shall observe the same rules of order and decorum applicable to members of the council and city staff. Unauthorized remarks or demonstrations from the audience, such as applause, stamping of feet, whistles, boos, yells, and or other demonstrations shall not be permitted. Violation of these rules could result in removal from the meeting by security. It also helps us make the meeting go faster and more efficient for everyone. Um, the, we will now go into public comment. Public comment is the opportunity for um, Scottsdale citizens, Scottsdale business owners, and or property owners to comment on non-agendized items that are within the council's jurisdiction. 
Advocacy for or against a candidate or ballot measure during a council meeting is not allowed pursuant to state law and is therefore not deemed to be within the council's jurisdiction. No official council action can be taken on public comment items which are not on the agenda. And uh, speakers would be limited to three minutes each. I'm looking at the clerk. There are no requests for public comment at this point. So at this point, I close public comment. That would be anything applicable that is not on the agenda. Uh, our next uh, item is item number one. Item number one is the consideration of the Temporary Water Supply Intergovernmental Agreement, IGA. Uh, the presenters are Brian Beesmeyer, Water Resources Executive Director, and Jim Thompson, City Manager. Uh, as we go through the process, there will be a, an opportunity for public comment, but the presentation will begin with our, our staff. Uh, please proceed. Hi, Brian. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, Brian Biesmeyer, uh, Scottsdale Water Executive Director, and I have a short presentation for you on a possible intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County for temporary water supply to Rio Verde foothills. Let's see if it's not coming up. Flying a little blind on the display in front of me, so we'll go from there. Oop, let me go back. There we go. A little background. A Rio Verde Foothills, as you know, is not in Scottsdale. It's not serviced by Scottsdale Water. We don't have pipes going out there. We don't offer standard utility service there. They are, however, they get their water either through wells, residential wells, or hauled water. And we have... Um, allowed water haulers to take water from a fill, fill station, but it's the water haulers that are our customers, not the residents. As a result of Scottsdale Water Resources reduction as a result of the Tier 1 shortage on the Colorado River, um, and then now a Tier 2A shortage on the Colorado River, uh, the filling station was turned off to non-residents as of December 31st, 2022. That action was based on Scottsdale Drought Management Plan as adopted by Council. Just a background on notifications because I know there's been some information out there that I don't think clarified the notifications that Scottsdale gave to folks in Rio Verde foothills as well as elected leaders. So um, discussions about water hauling and out there have occurred, at least to my knowledge, since 2015, and I've met with different groups of residents since 2015 about water hauling in the Rio Verde foothills, and have continued to place an emphasis on the fact that the long-term, Scottsdale is not the long-term solution for Rio Verde foothills water supply. In 2020, uh, a letter was sent to Representative Kavanaugh and uh, Maricopa County Supervisor Chukri uh, in May of 2020 that expressed the same concerns and stated that should Scottsdale's water supply be reduced as a result of Colorado River shortages, Rio Verde foothills would also be subject to being reduced or eliminated, our service would be reduced or eliminated to Rio Verde foothills. Then in August of 2021, the city manager um, authorized stage one of our drought management plan as a result of cutbacks of our Colorado River supply. And then in October of that same year, we notified our customers out there, which included water haulers. Um, and there were a few individual folks that hauled water with their own vehicle or trailer. Um, but it was predominant, predominantly the water haulers as our customers were notified in 2021. And then, and so that was 14 months before the water was turned off. And then again in August of 2022, another notice was sent to our customers. And these are the critical elements that we believe should be in an uh, IGA with Maricopa County. So these are the backbone elements that staff believes, and the purpose of this presentation is to get council's approval and discussion on these items. So the first is it's a temporary agreement for the county to act as an on emergency basis to provide water to Rio Verde Foothills. The second is the contracts only with the county they are the representatives for those folks in that, in that area. 
No city responsibility after delivery of water to water haulers. So we would only allow certified water haulers to take water and then our responsibility ends when we deliver that water into those trucks. County must attempt a building moratorium to the extent allowed by state law. Contingent on the city's obtaining water resources, of, so the, the agreement would be contingent on our getting additional water resources. So we're not taking from our own portfolio of water resources. The city will supply no more water to the folks in Rio Verde foothills than we have historically provided. So in 2022, we provided 126 acre feet of water. Now that was the highest we've ever provided. It's been slowly going up over a number of years, but that's the highest we've ever provided to the Rio Verde foothills, to water haulers servicing the Rio Verde foothills. And so that's 126 acre feet. Count, we would only have a single customer and that would be the county. Now obviously we would be able to give the county a record of each of the water haulers that were working for the county, but we would have a single customer that would be the county. If our access to water is constrained in any way, we would constrain the water deliveries to Rio Verde foothills. So if our allocation of water that we were able to acquire was reduced, we would then reduce the water deliveries to Rio Verde foothills. And the county would pay the city $1,000 per month as a base fee and then $21.25 per thousand gallons of potable water. Now this includes the new water cost of acquiring that water. Um, it's, an, it's an estimate. We're still talking to several um, providers, so that's, that's our estimate. Um, but it includes that cost, it includes treatment and transportation, as well as our lost water that we lose in part of transportation and through distribution, and the capital assets, maintenance and replacement. So the replacement cost of that facility is also included in that cost. And then we would also include a 5% annual escalation clause, or, or should our costs go up past 5%, the actual, our actual costs. And finally, uh, we believe it should be a two-year term with an optional third year. Um, again, we are only the interim solution. The county uh, has suggested that EPCOR, but whoever the final solution is, this gives them time for that final solution. So staff's recommendation is adoption of resolution 12758. And I won't read that the whole slide up to you, but it's, it's for uh, adoption of that resolution. And that ends my presentation subject to your question. Thank you very much. At this point, we have the opportunity to uh, listen to the public. So I will, uh, we have a list of 10 people who are wishing to speak. Um, I would uh, like uh, Alex McLaren, then John Hornuer, and, and then Doreen Hornuer. And um, you have three minutes maximum, if you can do that shorter. Uh, the, secondly, uh, the second thing I would ask, uh, so if you could state your uh, name, a dr uh, place of residence, and then also um, whether you're suing the city or not. I think that might be a little trivia that we should see. So proceed, uh, Alex McLaren. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Alex McLaren, 7624 East Osborne Road. I think I've appeared before you before on this issue. I'd like to congratulate the city on working on this, being flexible, and coming to a, some kind of resolution. I think, as Brian said, this is, a, this is an interim solution which will help people over the hump, if you like, these two years in which a, a, a permanent solution, in my view, the EPCOR solution is the best one, but this will help people in the area. So I strongly support this and congratulate the, the council on, on doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, John Hornuer and Doreen Hornuer. Hello, council members. This has been a community I've, oh, I apologize. My name is John Hornor, H-O-R-N-E-W-E-R, -E and I live in the Rio Verde Foothills community, and I have for the last 20 years. 
this issue, the fact that it's been so politicized is just mind numbing. These are people's lives. Um, I personally want to thank each and every one of you for taking that into consideration. That's why we're here. This community couldn't have survived. It couldn't have grown without you. It couldn't have survived without you. It can't survive without you. I've been hauling water to this community for 20 years. I've watched it grow from infancy to what it is now. The wildcat development, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, things are out of control. We have, to, we have to find a way to balance out growth and live within the means of the water that we have and the water that we will have based on the drought conditions. It's imperative that a solution is found very rapidly. And as a water hauler, I'm, I can't be any more clear than this. In a very short amount of time, people are going to start running out of water. This isn't a, oh, the sky is falling. This is reality. Okay, my wife and I, we work this business seven days a week, 365 days a year, because water, you can't go out without water. It's just, it's not possible. So to see what's happening right now is very concerning because in a very short amount of time, the logistics of being able to try and supply 55 million gallons a year to a community become unrealistic without, without your help, the city of Scottsdale. Um, it's just, we can truck it in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but without the city of Scottsdale, people are gonna start running out of water, okay? Mayor Ortega, I, we're not asking for a Santa Claus. We know there's no Santa Claus, and I really appreciate the efforts you've made to put this on the table. I personally feel that our board, our, our county supervisor, Thomas Galvin, made the wrong decision and put it in your lap, as he did, and now the ping pong beat games begin. Uh, and all I can say or ask from this point on is please try and limit the match, okay? Um, I say I have 16 seconds, 15 seconds left. That's our clock. That really is our clock in this community. So please, please, please get it negotiated with county as quickly as you can. And, and for county, I know you're listening, come to the table and negotiate. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Doreen Hornower and uh, Karen Nabitti. Then Cody Rim Rhyme. So Doreen. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to come before you. Mayor Ortega, council people. <laughs> um, I just have a few things to say, very short. Um, my husband and I have been hauling water for, I think, 22 years. Um, we moved out to the Rio Verde area in 1999 with a less than one-year-old. <laughs> and um, so it's a beautiful area. We love it. We were given the opportunity to be out there, and we were always been entrepreneurs, as I've stated in other talks. Um, and we wanted to have our kids to be raised out in an area where there was open land, nature, and just space. And that uh, that area affords that to us. In the meantime, we switched businesses to haul water because it was a necessity, and. We've been doing it, as I said, for a very long time. So we know how to do the business. We know how to do it well. And the city of Scottsdale, thank you, has been a great proponent in us advancing our business. Um, with the distance we now have to haul water from, um, sure, we could hire, have more trucks, hire more people, but that's not the answer. The answer is to come to an agreement or a situation where we have a closer source of water that will bring down the costs for 
all of our customers and the people that live in Rio Verde. And we need to um, be able to have, um, well, I can't do anything about the gas, but at least we can have it a little bit closer to the people and a reasonable cost. Um, the one thing I wanted to address in your proposal, which I thought was very well thought out, you guys, and I appreciate all the uh, points that you made. Um, I just want to say in my personal and humble opinion, there are some people that in our area that quite can't afford hauled water. And you would say, well, gee, why would you move there, right? Well, as haulers, you know, we have a lot of compassion and we feel for people and we know how hard, how hard work, how much hard work you have to do to get money. And so we always appreciated people who wanted to haul water. We never, we never criticized or, you know, or told them they couldn't have monitoring systems for their tanks because they haul themselves. They have that opportunity and they should have that right. And so I'm here to say that I would like to see them have an opportunity to be able to bring their costs to a more affordable place for themselves so they can continue to live in the beautiful area where we live. And, um, and that would be one of the things I would address in the points that you've presented. Um, other than that, um, I'm thinking that that's the biggest point for me, because I want everybody to have the opportunity for water, not just those that can afford it, um, as far as the cost with hauling. It adds a whole new dimension to the cost. Um, and we try to keep our costs down as much as possible. My whole family works at business. We work at seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We have no life. <laughs> and we just deliver water. So, and it's been a sacrifice. It still is. And I'm out of time. <laughs> but thank you thank, very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next, we, we will have uh, Karen Abadie and uh, Cody Rhyme and Rochelle Rhyme. Uh, Hi, my name is Karen Nabity, K-A-R-E-N, last name N-A, N as in Nancy, A, B as in boy, I-T-Y. My address is 13730 East Cavedale Drive at Scottsdale, Arizona, 85262. And that's only because I have a post office in Scottsdale <laughs> that says that. Um, okay, the, um, first, thank you to all of you, and really, Huge thanks to Brian Beesmeyer. I don't see him right now. Um, but his whole team um, has been awesome. All of you have been awesome for the last four years um, working with our community. So we appreciate that. Um, Supervisor Galvin sent you all a letter today, recently. And it stated um, that the important items for discussion are source of water, calculation of cost, limitations on transportation, so I'd like to make some comments on that. <laughs> um, source of water. I and other residents have worked for the last four years trying to secure a source of water for our community. And we've worked with Brian, we've worked with you guys getting approvals to move forward on a solution. Unfortunately, that solution was turned down by Supervisor Galvin. So now we, we need a um, solution in within your document. Um, it says that if the tier gets worse or if, if you guys have limitations, we could lose our source of water for the community that we, you would be providing. So I would ask that the source of water you get from us has nothing to do with the Colorado River, so we could keep getting that water because we know next year and the next year it will just be getting worse. Um, on calculation of cost, if there's any way that you could be reducing that, that would be greatly appreciated. And then limitations of transportation. Um, this one hits, hits the hardest for me, for our residents, because I've heard from so many people. We, um, it states that there's a cutoff date of January 3rd, 23. And with that date, we have residents that are already living in their home, um, like Melissa Asaf, who um, just moved in in the last 30 days. And to leave these people that in good faith had bought their own property or hired a builder to build their home for them and leave them without water. Um, I don't see the harm of, with that 126 acre feet, allowing the water to be spread amongst the community, even if we have to take some conservation measures on our own to make it work for our community. And with that, I thank all of you for listening and for being here tonight for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Cody Rime and Rochelle Rime, and then Jessica. 
Uh, Millman. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe that uh, the next speaker donated the time to me. I don't know if the clerk caught that. Um, you, you have one extra minute. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Cody Rhyme. I live in Rio Verde Foothills. I'll be very fast because I was prepared for six. Um, I would like to thank, start off by thanking everyone that had a role in this solution coming to the table tonight. Um, this council, city staff, um, and uh, Supervisor Galvin, Representative Cook, uh, Senator Cavanaugh, Representatives Griffin, and Colladin. Um, as grateful as we are, we have a few serious concerns with the proposed solution um, when it comes to affordability. The um, uh, prior to January 1st, and I realize that we won't get back to the old pricing, I understand that, but the pricing that is being proposed today is severely um, elevated in comparison to what we were paying prior. Um, and, and it really won't necessarily affect the costs that we're paying now for the reduced amount of water that are coming in. So uh, prior to January 1st, 2023, the cutoff uh, date, the uh, city was charging $7 per 1,000 gallons or one unit of water. This included treating the water, delivering it via existing piping to the Pima and Jomax fill station. And uh, please keep in mind the cost of the $7 per unit uh, to the customers was while Scottsdale was supplying its own water from its own portfolio. Under the new proposed plan, the water that is now outside Scottsdale's portfolio and its use not having a negative impact on Scottsdale's existing water will now cost $21.95 per unit, $21.95. Uh, what on earth could possibly be justifying a 313% increase in cost? The only comparable item in cost is the proposed long-term solution through EPCOR. They have estimated $18 to $20 per unit, but this includes accounting for the cost to design, construct entirely new infrastructure. Scottsdale's infrastructure is existing and the cost of obtaining the water has been removed. So please justify this increase in cost. Uh, when determining cost, also please keep in mind those in our community who are on a fixed income and cannot absorb the, such an increase in cost that is being proposed here today. Um, in regards to viability, um, where exactly will the water come from under this proposed solution? Um, I've seen the news and, and per that recent coverage, uh, Mayor Ortega's interview with Bram Resnick on Sunday, it appears the mayor believes the city will, can obtain water uh, all 600 acre feet up front from either the Gila River Indian community or the Colorado R River Indian community. Uh, both have stated that this is not possible. This seems it will be, uh, it will cause the proposal to be a non-starter uh, without water to, to pull from. Uh, the mayor himself stated that in the same interview that Scottsdale is not responsible for Rio Verde Foothills and that we are not the stepchild of Scottsdale. Um, and that uh, we are in fact wards of the county with that being said, why does the mayor feel such a need and responsibility to control where and who in the CAP, the county on behalf of Rio Verde Foothills, obtains the water? The entities and avenues the mayor has been talking, uh, are taking to obtain access to water um, and in excess of Scottsdale's portfolio uh, have clearly not panned out. There is, however, still a viable water source in the CAP that the county could obtain from, uh, water from. This source is EPCOR. Um, I obtained a FOIA request. You all have, uh, should have that document. It addresses the EPCOR solution. It was a viable solution as, as of October. Uh, there's more documents that are in the FOIA request that you do not have that I can get to you if you'd like. Um, I don't know what happened with um, EPCOR after it was presented to the, the city. Um, council members, uh, later on in the following weeks commented stating that the EPCOR pathway seemed reasonable and seemed like a good plan. Uh, it, appear, it appears this plan was not pursued further, however. With all of this, I would ask with respect that the council please review the terms and costs of similar treat and transport agreements that you have with Carefree and Tonto Hills. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Jessica Millam. Milman, excuse me, and Christy Jackman. It's okay, it happens all the time. <clears throat> I'm Jessica Melman. I live in the Rio Verde foothills. My husband and I moved there about seven months ago. Uh, we're very happy out there. We absolutely love where we live. Uh, I wanna thank the council for all their work to get us to this point tonight. 
and for allowing the residents of the Rio Verde foothills to, to speak on their behalf as well. My husband and I have learned a lot over the past several months and met some really wonderful neighbors. Since December 2022, we have been collecting rainwater, flushing our toilets once a day, um, and eating off of paper plates in order to conserve our precious water resources. It would be nice to see residents in other part, in other communities in the state take similar steps to conserve moving forward. I'm focusing my very brief remarks today on one of the issues driving these decisions around a water solution, ongoing wildcat building. In all of the chaos over the past several months, one thing has become very clear to us. In addition to needing to secure water for our community, we all agree that wildcat development cannot continue. The residents of the Rio Verde foothills hear you. We agree with you. We want to work on the same side of the table as you to ensure that unchecked building is curtailed. We need you, the city of Scottsdale, to work with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next we have uh, Christy Jackman and Wendy Walker. Hi, thank you. Um, Mayor and council members, thank you for having us here tonight and for bringing this up. I have, um, I do live in Rio Verde and I do have kind of mixed emotions on this, but I'm very grateful that we're at this point. We do need your help. A couple of the things that I'd like to discuss, one is the cutoff date, the January 1, 2023, where you need to either, I believe it's occupy your home and already be existing. But my concern with that is that we currently have about 75 to 100 vacant homes. And if in that period of two years they are unable to sell those homes because there's no water, we're going to have squatters, we're going to have vandalism, we're going to have theft increase. Um, that could be quite a serious problem. The other thing I'm concerned about is, is the self-hauler issue. These folks have invested in trailers that they use and it does keep their water costs down. Um, if there's any way to work that into this, it would be really good. And then finally, I'm a little bit confused about why we need to have the 600 acre feet up front that seems like in this time of drought a bit of a challenge. Um, I suppose if it's possible, that's great. Um, but it does seem like perhaps that might be escalating the cost of the water to the people in Rio Verde because we're buying about 50% more than we're ever going to get back. And so if that's something we could also look at, that would be appreciated. Um, I think that's about all I really have to say, but mostly just thank you. I, I do appreciate you folks coming to the table, and I do look forward to you working with our supervisor so that we can get something ironed out and get these families functioning again. Thank you. Next we have Wendy Walker and uh, Jennifer Simpson, uh, followed by Casey Reeder. Hi, I'm Wendy Walker. I live in Rio Verde Foothills. I've actually been in Rio Verde Foothills since July of 2020 with my husband, Vance. So we are relatively newcomers, but not newcomers to the Valley. I'm celebrating my 30th year of working in a Fortune 10 company that has a main site that's located in North Scottsdale. I love Scottsdale. With that, I just want to say uh, mayor and council women and councilmen, thank you very much for number one, having us, allow us to do some public comment tonight. And then also to let you know that we really, really appreciate um, the proposal that you've put forth and your willingness to work with us. Um, the home that my husband and I bought is a water hauled home. And when we purchased that home, it was an existing home since 2009 and we were, basically told that the water hauling would continue to go on. So it was a little bit of a surprise to us when it was cut short. Um, that's one of the reasons why we really appreciate that you're willing to take a look at this and, and come to the table. We've looked at your proposal and I'm just, for me myself, as a resident that's occupying a house, I am extremely grateful 
and I'm grateful at the proposal that you've put forth, so I really appreciate it. So does my husband. Um, I, I just have a couple pieces, food for thought, and I think Karen Nabity, or Nabity, she mentioned it, so I'm going to stand behind and second that. Um, as far as people that have that cutoff period of January 3rd, um, we actually have a neighbor that's moving in in a week or two that's literally three homes away from us. It's a beautiful custom home. It's their dream home. They're coming from Chicago. They can't wait to be here. And I, I have a feeling they think that they've, they're moving into extreme North Scottsdale, just like my husband and I thought we were. And it, it, but it is indeed Rio Verde Foothills. So um, they actually are not occupying it. They, their home was finished in February. And there's, there's several other people that are just like that. This is just one example. And I would just really appreciate it, just for my neighbors in the community, if there might be a consideration or a contingency for specific situations like this. Because again, like, like you are, um, many, um, if not most, of the community at large in Rio Verde Foothills is very much opposed to a lot of this uncontrolled activity that everybody's calling the wildcat building. Um, so we do like the fact that you've got some level of restriction. We're just talking there's some contingencies. The other contingency are people with wells as their wells run down. So that's another consideration. Thank you. Uh, next we have Jennifer Simpson, then Casey Reeder, and Lee Harris is the uh, last speaker that I show. Hello, Mayor Ortega and council members. My name is Jennifer Simpson. I am a 24 years resident of Rio Verde Foothills. My address is 13824 East Olison Road. I do have a well, but I've been hauling water for 18 years. Um, I want to first thank the city of Scottsdale for their continued support of our community over the last five years. I want to tell them that I appreciate their cooperation and communication with the residents of the foothills all of that time. Um, Scottsdale's participation during this time um, has been uh, uh, very much appreciated. There's been total cooperation from them. I'm very disappointed that we've gotten to this point um, based upon the county turning us down for a, a very viable situation. I also want to point out that I'm not one of the people suing you, uh, which you asked to, to converse about. Um, uh, all of that being said, um, I have a couple of key items. Well, first, the, the, the most key item is your 1-3-23 date. We understand that you have to have um, certain dates within your parameters so that there is some sort of deadline. Um, I'm wondering if maybe the city and the county can come to terms with something more in line with uh, a building permit by that date because we'll end up with many homes that are, are have been sold since that point or will be sold up to the point of the execution of the agreement depending on how long that takes to negotiate. If that is something that the, the city of Scottsdale would uh, consider, would be very much appreciated. We might have homes that sit empty uh, for that term of two to three years, whatever it takes to get our final solution in play. Um, with that being said, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, so again, Casey Reeder and Lee Harris. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you so much for your time and for all the time that you have put into addressing our issue in Rio Verde Foothills. Uh, my name is Casey Reeder, K-A-S-E-Y-R-E-E-D-E-R. -E 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 my address is 31317 North 163rd Street, Scottsdale 85262. I've lived in Rio Verde now for nine years and I've been a self hauler for eight years. My average monthly expense as of now is about $80 a month, which has been great. But with this provision coming forward, 
that their self-haulers will not be able to get their own water, I will be forced to use a commercial water hauler. Now that might not sound like it's the worst thing in the world, actually it's not, but with the proposed numbers, my expenses will go from $90 to $1,500 a month. This is unacceptable. It's, it's obscene and it's insurmountable. I couldn't, I can't do it. Please, please find it in your heart to take care of those of us who are self haulers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Lee Harris. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. I am Lee Harris. I live in the far northeast corner of the Rio Verde foothills. Before that, I was a citizen of Scottsdale for 25 years. And um, I want to thank you, Scottsdale. Scottsdale, Scottsdale, you've been with us for the last four years, and we truly appreciate everything that you did to make sure that we could become responsible for ourselves through our own government entity created by a water district. You supported every step of that, and we are very sorrow that that didn't come through where we could have water today. We have been living 52 days on rainwater and bottled water at our house. We haven't showered there for almost two months. So we obviously are right there in the crucible. We are wards of the county, as you said, Mr. Mayor, and wisely so. And we truly appreciate that you are putting the chess pieces on the board that are accurate. We want the county to step up to the plate and take care of us because we are indeed their taxpayers, not the city of Scottsdale taxpayers. We truly appreciate all of you opening your hearts at least to talk, to propose what could be. I don't know if it will be possible to put it forth between the ping pong that John had brought up. But there are many of us who are suffering and it's way more than 500 people. It's 500 properties specific, but 200 more that are relying on wells that are dropping. And there will be more as this drought continues and the drought takes away that water which once supported us from the city of Scottsdale as we imported it. We are the ultimate consumers. We have no pipes. We cannot reclaim, we cannot recycle. We are children that want water but won't step forward to take the adult path to secure it. And now we are here begging at your doorstep to help us. We are reliant upon the County Board of Supervisors to deal plainly with you, and we hope that they will do so. But as Casey put forth, there are innocents that will be caught up in this. And for that, the county is also responsible, not Scottsdale. If it means that they have to pass a tax on all residents of the county island that is the Rio Verde foothills and spread that cost to help those indigents, then so be it. We need to be responsible. Thank you so very much for everything you've done for us. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment. Um, and um, I will clarify in response to um, um, some comments made by Mr. Reem. Uh, that is um, uh, the characterization uh, perhaps you did not see the uh, press release today. Uh, it was sent out officially by the city. We had a three-day weekend, and the press release stated that any um, third-party source, I did misspeak, uh, that was asked 
There may be others, and whatever criticism you feel justified, you need to look at that memo. I'm just suggesting that you do that. And any perpetuating of uh, uh, obstacles uh, is covered to the best we can because we want true custody of water. And the other point I will make about public comment has to do with the clause that was stated by A.G. Mays. And it talked about the emergency, health and otherwise, to those living there at that time. We're not talking about speculators or somebody that moves in and becomes a future victim of the drought. We're talking about the urgency that was precipitated by answering directly through the county as a responsible party, not for future speculators that built homes that are halfway done or three quarters way done that may have somebody waiting for water and using that future excuse, which would burden us trying to meet those that were addressed by the AG's memo. The other thing I will state is that this is not a rate hearing. We are not a commission here to, we have all the backup paperwork that's required in order to justify the exact terms and conditions that have been laid out. So once again, I did not modify verbally. I said I misspoke, if you want to say it that way. I was not being an unfair to you or anyone else. And I don't think that there's a dead end in that clause that we're saying there will be a best effort in that, in that manner. Now, I also don't see any children here today. And we have had children coming up to this kiva and somewhat looking dismayed and perhaps even smirking at, at, at us up here. And I find that to have been a little bit of a difficult thing to handle. I, I'm very glad that we're all adults here and we don't have children carrying signs against or, 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 or doing that. That was also, um, and we did not have the ability until the AG's um, uh, opinion said, in fact, that the jurisdiction that we can deal with is the county, not scattered residents and so forth. That's the duty that we have as caretakers to Scottsdale Water. Our primary responsibility is to the 9,000 meters that we have connected to residents, businesses, hospitals, schools. That's my duty, right? Um, I also have heard, again, just responding to some testimony. The fact is, I, I think a, a tanker holds, what, 4,000 gallons? Say, say 4,000 gallons, okay? So, you know, that is $84 worth of water, okay? Plus delivery cost. So how things get extrapolated out into the stratosphere, I'm unsure about that. But again, I have pipe water from Scottsdale Water. So this is how we're rolling. We're making the best effort to deal with primary parties. And we can have questions at this point, and I'll have further comments. But I want to uh, be sure and respond to some of those comments that were made. At this point, uh, Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilwoman Janik. Thank you, Mayor. I just really want to thank all of you who came today. I received so many emails. We've received a lot of emails from our constituents and from Rio Verde, so both sides of the border. And so I really do appreciate it. I am incredibly pleased to be here and to reach the milestone that we're at tonight. And while I agree, it, you know, there is no such thing as perfection, but um, with its passage, we're going to finally take a big step forward towards getting Rio Verde foothills um, a permanent water solution. And that is something the community never had. And I think that will be a relief for all parties. So I'm, I'm very supportive of the plan. Um, the agreement, <laughs> it's, it involves many, many different government agencies. Um, I think it showcases how well Arizonans work together and uh, 
really for the benefit of real people. So from the AG's office to our council to the county, I think possibly the media missed the finer point of how well we work together, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, but this agreement truly did balance a lot of needs. Um, I felt blindsided by the county's decision not to uh, move forward with the DWID. However, that's okay. We're problem solvers. Um, our city staff uh, got right back to work and we uh, continue to look at different options to um, achieve the three goals we needed to achieve, which is of course, to meet the objectives of our um, drought management plan and our obligation to our citizens to get water flowing to our neighbors and also to close the loophole of unregulated development that got us here in the first place. Nobody should buy a house in Arizona that doesn't have water. So today, I think we're pretty darn close to getting those first two objectives met. I'm just thrilled. Um, I also, I do want to correct one thing that was out there in the media, and that is that somehow this city council had an opportunity to solve the problem in October and didn't. Believe me, if there was a solution, uh, we would have, we would not be here tonight. There were a lot of ideas proposed, uh, really not even in writing, not even the back of the napkin kind of stuff, proposed in October. Um, everybody should be glad that city policy is dictated by a lot more rigor than just talk. And we, our staff looked into every, um, every suggestion made and that one didn't pan out, but this one did. So I really can't state enough that had there been a solution, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. So, but again, here we are with something that I think will take a big step forward. Our staff would not put into an agreement lightly a commitment to water that we believe we can get. And I guarantee you that our staff considered price and security when they made the decision to either go for the 600 or the 200. And certainly our pricing structure, cities don't make a profit. So our pricing structure is based on a number of factors, including the fact that it's not just that we deliver water, but we expect the effluent to come back to us. So these are just many factors, but our staff can provide people more information if they're interested. Um, I do want to point out just, you know, I think everybody deserves a thank you. Um, but I do want to point out um, two people in particular whose uh, legal expertise got us here tonight, Attorney General Chris Mays and Scottsdale's Assistant City Attorney, Luis Santayoyo. Their expertise is uh, impressive and helped bring all parties together. You know, of course, I want to thank our city manager, Jim Thompson, our city attorney, Sherry Scott, Brian Beesmeyer, our water, Scottsdale Water Director, um, all of us, my, my colleagues, the mayor, our, our colleagues on the county side and in the legislature. Um, I still, our job's not done. And all of you, many of you mentioned it. So we'll continue to work to close the loophole that hurt you and is hurting communities, unincorporated co communities throughout the state. But thank you all for being here. Councilwoman, Councilwoman Janik and then Councilmember Grant. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, this has been a very emotional, difficult situation for all of us. Water is life, and now we really know that. And I want to say that I appreciate the state legislators for what they did. It was difficult. Some of the comments that were made were really nasty. On the other hand, it focused on the immediacy of the issue, and it got everybody together to come up with a solution. Is it perfect? No. Is it very, very good? Yes. And as Councilwoman Whitehead said, more work does need to be done. And we, we know that. But this is a wonderful, giant step forward. Um, I want to thank our city manager, Jim Thompson. Um, he's done an amazing job representing us in throughout all these difficult negotiations. Um, Brian Beesmeyer, our executive director of Scottsdale Water, 
who we trust so much and appreciate all that he has brought to Scottsdale with his expertise. I also want to thank the mayor because he took most of the hits and that is a very difficult role to play. So thank you, Mayor, for being steadfast. I really appreciate it. And my fellow city council members, they have done an amazing amount of work. We have had a whole lot of time spent on this. We hope that this is the prototype regulation to start to begin to solve the water problem, not just for Scottsdale, but for all the other cities in the Valley and for the state in general. So with that, I would actually like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 12758 to authorize IGA number 2023-030-COS with Maricopa County for the treatment and provision of potable water at a city standpipe for delivery to residents in the Rio Verde foothills area and determination the provisions of water to the county following acquisition of additional raw water, I'm sorry, raw water supply, is consistent with the city drought management plan. Number two, the city manager, with the approval of the city attorney, to execute IGA number 2023-030-COS, substantially in the form authorized by this resolution. Number three, the city manager and city attorney or that their designees to take such further actions and execute such documents as necessary to carry out the intent of this resolution. Second. second. Okay, I caught that second. <laughs> Next we will have Councilmember Graham and then Councilwoman Caputi, Durham, and myself. Um, well, uh, there's not much more to add to what's already been said. I appreciate so much of what my colleagues have said up here tonight. I agree with Councilmember Janik about how much, um, how many uh, arrows has been ta have been taken by the mayor, um, and uh, I just want to reiterate a lot of what they said. I think that, you know, this is a temporary agreement. It's a temporary agreement, and while many of us consider it to be a win-win, it's a clear and fresh reminder of how provincial and how personal water is, and water is to people. And so I'm very proud of the t this temporary agreement. And um, what I, one thing I'm very proud of is that it confirms both our water autonomy and it confirms that this council, my colleagues, uh, duty for our, with our water is that our preeminent priority is to our residents. Uh, my biggest regret about all of this besides some of the sideshow and everything else we've seen to but like Councilmember Janik said, that brings people, sometimes you need that to bring people to the table and get people to make, uh, to work together. Um, I do regret the amount of time that our city staff have, have had to allocate to this project. Um, those, the number of hours and attention uh, and lost sleep is probably untold. Um, Scottsdale has been, from what I've read and everything I've learned about, um, our relationship with the Rio Verde Foothills people. Um, we have been very generous with uh, our, playing our role in supplying water to that area. And my hope is that this extra time from this temporary agreement can facilitate the time that is needed to produce a permanent solution for the great people of Rio Verde Foothills. So with that, um, heart of appreciation and uh, again, I'm, I'm very thankful about how this confirms our water sovereignty and our preeminence of prioritizing Scottsdale residents. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Caputi, then Vice Mayor Remotely Littlefield. Well, Councilwoman Janik beat me to the motion, so I definitely approve that we're moving this forward. I just want to remind everyone here tonight that we are actually not here to negotiate with ourselves. We've spent months coming up with a solution and we had some very uh, complicated deal points that had to be met and we finally are coming forward because we did manage to check all of those deal points that were important to us. But again, we're not negotiating here tonight. What we are doing is simply approving that this contract be moved or the, the decision to move this forward goes to the county now and the county will take a look at it and, and things will keep moving and it will be a work in process. 
The um, number three on our motion suggests that the city manager and city attorney are being empowered to take further actions and execute documents as necessary to carry out the intent of this resolution. And so we are empowering our city manager and city attorney to continue forward. And you know, as, as our city manager loves to say, we're not necessarily landing the plane tonight. So I know there's still some questions out there, but we're gonna continue to negotiate with the county and make sure that we have uh, an agreement that obviously advantages our own residents, but also um, is neighborly and has a good outcome for our uh, neighbors in Rio Verde. So I'm, I'm very happy to join in the, adopt, uh, in, the, in the agreement to move this forward to the county and let's hear from anyone else who wants to talk, I imagine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, remotely, we have Vice Mayor Littlefield. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, this has been in a very emotional week for every one of us. And we are very happy that we could help our neighbors. We all wanted to do that. We're very glad that we could turn to the solution. I'd like to personally thank Brian Beesmeyer and Tim Simpson for their efforts and their hard work in coming to this agreement. And I'd like to also thank Mayor Taylor for willing to stand up there and basically do the target arrows being shot at him uh, while this is all going on. Um, I think this is a good, a good way to, to begin a new relationship and to start a relationship with you and Bernie. And you are a neighbor. You need to remember that. None of us want to do the thing without another. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, in conclusion, I would I would add, um, I met with um, uh, Attorney General Mays and her staff, and our city attorney met as well. Our city manager and attorney met with the county manager and the county attorney. And we acted very swiftly within one week of when the opinion came out. We had our deal points in action. That was swift action by the city of Scottsdale. And we had somebody to talk to as a jurisdiction with some responsibility and authority in the county. And that's how this moved forward. So there are, uh, I want to as well thank our council for being very diligent. As I said, many, many hours were put in, and I know that um, we are moving forward, and we have to respect, number one, our residents in Scottsdale, and our obligation to every commercial, hospital, school, and resident in this city, because I'm one of them, and I've been here 45 years. So I've invested in our water system, and yes, it is very important to me personally. The last thing I would add is I know a couple city employees that live in Rio, Rio Verde. I talked to one last week, and again, I have to be more objective. They happen to have a well, certain people, you know, et cetera. So these are, these are people that we know and employees. I don't know many of you, as, but I do know of others in a personal way. So with that, we will call for a vote and uh, please record your vote. Yes. Thank you, that is unanimous. We are concluded with, oh, excuse me, uh, with that item. Um, so thank you very much and we will proceed with the next portion of our, um, um, our agenda. If you would leave quietly, we'd appreciate that and uh, continue conversation outside if necessary. Item number two is receipt of citizen petition. Um, and um, as this is an opportunity in our charter which allows any citizen to come forward with a petition and uh, bring that to uh, our body. There was none recorded, so therefore we have no citizen petition. At this point, I will close that matter. Secondly, we have a second opportunity for uh, public comment. I see no uh, public comment at this time. So we will um, 
now go into um, our next part of our agenda, which is listed as a work study. Work study sessions provide a less formal setting for the mayor and council to discuss specific topics with each other and the city staff and provide staff an opportunity to receive direction from the council. To provide an opportunity for the public input, yet uh, to, and we can get that conversation going, um, we also allow public comment on any of the listed uh, uh, work study items. Um, as I look over to the, um, our clerk, we do have one request to speak on, um, well, let me announce the work study items uh, involved. Uh, number one is quarterly financial update that will be uh, presented by our city treasurer, and then we will have a preliminary uh, fiscal year budget. Um, I am able to take public comment first, uh, but please declare which, which uh, issue you would like to address. And I show that Alex McLaren wishes to speak. Um, however, I uh, think he Mayor, stepped I, I believe he stepped away for a minute. Okay, uh, so uh, he's gone. That's okay. He, he'll be no. back. He, he didn't want to stay. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll, we'll uh, hold and revisit that in a, in a minute. So accordingly, uh, at this point, I will continue with Mayor, the... Mayor. Oh, excuse me. Alex McLaren, come forward, please, sir. I understand you wish to speak to work study item number two. Again, Alex McLaren, 7624 East Osborne. I was a member of this, uh, the city's uh, Bond Oversight Commission or committee for a number of years. And obviously the bond, I know you're discussing the overall <coughs> CIP tonight, but the bond 2019 is an integral part of that. And I was concerned about the agenda item that went to the citizens committee, I think it was about a week or so ago, where they were uh, discussing the, the fire facility and the shortage of funds there for, and they were, they were asked to come up with a, uh, I think it was on the agenda, item number nine, they were asked to come up with suggestions for how the city could make up the shortfall in the amount of money. And I think they adopted a, 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 a not a resolution, but adopted a motion that they couldn't do that because they didn't have enough information. And that's correct in my view. The bond commission is to do with the bond or the bond committee is to do with the bond. They have a responsibility to look at what the voters approved in 2019 and they can't shift projects from question to question. You are fixed by the, uh, by the amount of the, of the bond proposal. And I know Mr. Worth has provided chapter and verse on, on how Costs have escalated, uh, but I think it was a little unfair to expect the committee to, to make a recommendation to you, the city council, who have the overall responsibility for not only the bond 2019, but also for the capital improvements. And I noted that a week later, uh, you approved the, uh, the contract, uh, the GMP for the construction of the facility with the addition of $10 million from the uh, Bell Road ball fields. Um, so I think that was the correct decision. Uh, I think there is a possibility that the bond 29 funding will not be sufficient to, uh, um, to fund all the projects that were called out in the bond 29. It's happened before. Um, I remember bond 2000 where Pinnacle Peak Road, we were meant to build that. That was part of the, the transportation element and we did not build that because we, had, we needed the money for the Indian Bend Road Bridge. And there've been other instances of well, as well. So I think I've looked through the presentation tonight. Obviously there's a lot of information that you're going to have to digest, but I think the Bond 29 issue uh, 
is critical, obviously, and I thank God we had the, the money from those various land sales. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the quarterly financial update with our expert in finance, Sonia Andrews, city treasurer. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. This is our quarterly financial update. Next slide. So I just wanted to start by saying that the primary focus of our quarterly financial update is to highlight any economic drivers impacting city revenues. And also because the general fund is the city's largest operating fund, our uh, focus on the quarterly financial update is also to report on the general fund revenues and expenditures, specifically sales tax trends, since sales tax is the largest revenue source in our general fund, and any budget to actual variances in the general fund. So that's pretty much the focus of the quarterly update. Next slide. So, Oh. So we're more than halfway through our current fiscal year. For the first half of the year, consumers started pulling back on spending. That is what we expected. We talked about this in previous updates where in the past two years, we've had a lot of pent-up demand and pandemic spending. So we do expect consumers to start pulling back on their spending, and that's what we're seeing in the first half of this fiscal year. Also, as expected, our dining and hotel motel tax collections continue to be really strong because of the Super Bowl and other events that are bringing more visitors to our city. And overall, our general fund for the first half of the year, revenues and expenditures are pretty much in line with our budget with some minor variances, which I'll go over in a bit. Next slide. So this chart, this chart shows the sales tax collections in our general fund. Last year we saw, as you can see, last year, 2021-22, we saw a 21% growth in our sales tax, again, like I said, due to the pent-up demand, pandemic spending, and also inflation. This year, as consumers are starting to pull back on spending, with the inflation, uncertainties of the economy, rising interest rates, you can see on the far right of the slide, our sales tax revenue is growing at a slower pace. Factoring in the inflation, our growth in real terms is probably negative. However, as I said, we have been expecting this, and um, we, are, uh, we have planned accordingly in our budget. Next slide. And this slide breaks down our sales tax by major category. We actually expected a, a larger pullback in consumer spending this year when we put the budget together back in April last year. So year to date, our sales tax collections are actually 10% over what we budgeted for for the first half of the year. Next slide. And overall, general fund revenues are 7% or $11.9 above budget, mostly because of sales tax. For the other categories of revenues, the variances are due to a combination of timing differences, higher interest earnings, and other miscellaneous variances. Next slide. On the expenditure side, the negative variances are mainly due to higher fire overtime, um, unexpected and unexpected PSPRS refund payment for fire personnel costs and a transfer to our CIP funds for a pre-purchase of ambulances that we did not anticipate in our budget. Next slide. And looking at the expenditures by division, the negative variance is in admin services, that is our IT and HR departments or divisions, is due to timing of invoice payments and the negative variance in fire, as we talked about, is due to increased in overtime. And that uh, concludes my quarterly financial update, and I can answer any questions that you might have. Sure. At this point, we do have uh, Vice Mayor Littlefield, uh, Councilwoman Janik, and Councilmember uh, Graham um, responding. So let's lead off with Vice Mayor Littlefield. Oh, thank you, Mayor. But I'm, I'm afraid I Excuse me, Kathy. You, for some reason, we are getting a bit of an echo, which means perhaps you could speak a little slower. Or, uh, but we we get the volume. The volume's good. Uh, we'll try again. And uh, again, it's just a bit of a, a, a speakers. Uh, so, please repeat. Thank you. I didn't mean to have my hand up. I'm sorry. Uh, I. 
I agree with uh, what the treasurer has put up on that. What, what we uh, might do, Kathy, and I'm just trying, I'm sorry, I'm doing a mic check, lower the volume a little bit on your output. Let me pass. I'll pass on this. Thank you. I'm sorry. I I I wish there was what well, we will we will do our best and and the clerk will interpret for us in his. <laughs> Mary, I believe she didn't. She's saying she didn't have her hand up. So, okay. Uh, yeah. I apologize because Vice Mayor Littlefield is on my screen. Okay, you are to blame. Thank you very much. <laughs> sorry. Excuse me, Vice Mayor. Uh, here we're back to Councilwoman Janik and Councilmember Graham. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple of questions for our treasurer. Um, I know that we, and you did a very nice job, so thank you, as you always do. Um, I know that we realized that our intake was going to be reduced because the economy in general is slowing down. In your crystal ball and in your planning and with your knowledge base, how long are you expecting that to last um, is an estimate. Wish I had a really clear crystal ball to answer that question. Actually, I will answer that question in the next presentation when we give you a sneak peek of our fiscal year 23-24 budget. So if we can wait for that. Okay, yes. sure, thank you. Uh, Council Member Graham. Thank you, Mayor uh, and City Treasurer Sonia. Um, you know, I've got concerns about where we are with our CIP and our capital budgeting. I have concerns about costs increasing really sharply and revenues are not increasing nearly, nearly a pace. So I'm gonna express that concern for the record. And two questions. Excuse me, so, but we'll, we'll get a presentation on yes. CIP. Yes. And so, yeah, that's coming next. Yeah, so please, uh, if you have any questions about the revenue side. Yeah. So um, as far as, uh, Sonia, you made a comment about the, uh, the PS, PRS payment. Which, which um, that was under the funds used, right? Which line would that be for? Probably the, probably the uh, public safety fire. That is correct. Under, um, if you go back a couple slides. Right. Yes. Yeah, the, the six slide. How much was that payment? Yes. It was. I'm gonna have to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was about two million, two million. the PSPRS refund. Okay. So that refund was because the uh, actuaries miscalculated the contribution for the tier two firefighters, and so they misinterpreted state statute in what the contribution rate should be for the tier two for quite a few years and they discovered it this year and so the actuaries had to go back and recalculate what the actual contribution should have been and that generated a refund that we were required to give back to the tier two firefighters so it wasn't it's not a refund to us it's a refund to psprs right it, it's a refund to the firefighters yeah um, who was, do we hire the actuary or what, what happened? We, we don't. Yeah. Uh, PSPRS that, that's a state, hires that's the actuary. That's a statewide thing, right? Correct. And so they, you said they miscalculated over several years? Council Member Graham, they misinterpreted uh, the state statute. The state statute has specific provisions where the tier two contribution rate starts decreasing based on the funded status of the plan, and they missed that. So they were continuing to um, charge the firefighters at a higher contribution rate than state statute allowed. Oh, so they withheld from them more than they owed, and then they made us fill it in. They generated the actuarial report to oh. direct us to withhold more than they should have. Okay, that's pretty concerning. I, I mean, especially for like, I mean, City of Phoenix, or does that affect the whole, does that affect statewide? It depends on the um, funded status of our plan. So the way the, 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 um, the intent of the state statute is as the PSPR plan gets better funded, yeah. that the um, the, what the firefighters contribute would be lowered 
so that they don't continue to contribute at a higher percent and the city's contribution rate drops because the fund status of that plan improves, that there should be an equal lowering of their contribution as well. Okay. Okay. That, yeah, that, that's very interesting. The other thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned about invoice payment timing. Which, which, uh, which yes. line did that affect? Um, Sorry, so go to the next slide, which is the general fund uses by division. Yeah. That would be the admin services where we had a negative variance. And the timing difference on that was one of the IT invoices that should have been paid last year, but with timing differences, we didn't get presented with the invoice till this year, and the expenditures didn't go out till this year. But we know how much we're going to pay for that when we sign the contract. I mean, did that, um, and we've incurred the services before, the, was that accrued last year? It was just the timing difference where the services, it was probably a June, July issue where the services crossed over to July, and then the payments didn't you know, okay. paid in June. Though, though it should be pretty clear in the invoices though when the services are rendered and what period those belong in. Yes, it is very clear. We yeah. do accrue everything back yeah. and we do a very meticulous job. Our accounts payable department, our yeah. accounting department does a very meticulous job identifying all the invoices where services are rendered through June and accrue that back. And this is for uh, where the services did not uh, get performed in June from a timing standpoint, there was some delay. It was performed in July. I see. Okay, so it was a mismatch. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, proceed with the next uh, portion of your segment of your presentation. Um, I'm actually done with the quarterly financial update, and so the next presentation will be our um, preliminary fiscal year 23-24 budget outlook. Sorry, next slide. So we are um, right in the middle of our budget process right now, and I want to spend a little bit of time going through what our budget process looks like. Our budget process starts way back in October. Between October and December, departments are gathering the requests, personnel requests, IT and capital improvement requests, operating requests. In January to March, which we are right in the middle of, we are reviewing all those requests, we're projecting revenues, expenditures, we're looking at our reserve and debt requirements, and we're making decisions on those budget requests. We work very closely with the city manager and his leadership team to balance the budget. So this is the point that we're at right now. So very clearly, we do not have any finalized numbers, and this is really, truly a sneak peek and a very preliminary um, look at what we're expecting for fiscal year 23-24. And in April and June, we will proceed with a lot of the council presentations that you're familiar with and present the, pub, uh, the proposed budget, have our public hearings, and adopt the uh, budget, including the rates and fees and tax levies. Next slide. So for the preliminary outlook, I wanted to share with you what we would be expecting for fiscal year 23-24. We will take a look at our operating revenues, some, discuss some of our operating expenses and pensions, what we're seeing, and also the proposed debt issuances for fiscal year 23-24. Next slide. So what are we expecting for fiscal year 23-24 budget? As we talked about, we're, we are definitely expecting consumers to rein in spending. We believe that it is the coming to the end of the extraordinary stimulus. Uh, consumers are also drawing down their personal savings, and at some point there will no longer be more personal savings to spend. And with what the Fed feds are doing, the economy is expected to retract, and there's debate whether we're going to go into a recession or not. So bottom line is there's a lot of uncertainty as to consumer spending, and so we are planning for that. We budget conservatively. I'll show you in a minute how we're planning to budget for our fiscal year 23 and 24 revenues and beyond, but we are anticipating that, and we're planning for that through our budget process. On the state shared revenue side, that's another significant revenue source for our general fund. We have, we will be showing some increase in the state shared revenues followed by a decrease in the outer years. 
That's because our income tax revenues that's coming from the state is distributed to us two years in arrears. So as they implement the state flat tax, the 2.5% flat tax, which will reduce our share of revenues, we don't expect that reduction till two years later. Um, there's also lower population growth in Scottsdale compared to the other valley cities, and as the state share revenues are distributed based on population, we will probably be a smaller piece of the pie. Another thing I want to mention for our fiscal year 23-24 revenues is we have been spoiled with a lot of one-time revenues in the last couple years, namely the stimulus funds. We received $29 million in CARES money, another $29 million in the American Rescue Plan Act funds, and total almost $60 million of stimulus funds that assisted us with our special programs and helped free up some of our general fund dollars. We also sold two pieces of land, which provided $63 million for one-time capital project needs. So one-time revenues are just one-time, and we do not expect those one-time revenues to repeat in the next fiscal year. On the expenditure side, what we're expecting is there will be inflation pressures, as Council Member Graham mentioned. Labor cost increases, continue, the labor market continues to be very tight, so labor cost increases there. We're also seeing insurance premium increases, for example, like our cybersecurity in, uh, insurance has increased significantly. Cost of materials like asphalt, um, chemicals, and a, a variety of materials have also seen anywhere from a you know, 20 to 30 percent increase, and of course the cost of capital, which our Public Works Director Dan will address after my presentation. So, looking at operating revenues, next slide, next slide. Just wanted to touch on our operating revenues and what makes up our operating revenues. From a total city standpoint, local taxes, that's our sales tax and our property taxes, still make up 43% as the bulk of our city revenues. State shared makes up 14%, but a big part of our total city is also our enterprise funds, which are water, sewer, um, solid waste, and airport, and they are all self-supporting, fee-supported. They do not rely on taxes. There is no subsidy from the general fund. So we focus on the general fund because the general fund is our primary operating fund. It funds all our public safety, parks and rec, public works, you know, funds most of our um, government operations. When we look at the general fund, local sales tax makes up 44% of our general fund. State shared makes up 24%, and property taxes makes up 9%, and we have charges, fees and fines, and other miscellaneous like interest earnings mix up the rest of the revenues. Next slide. So when we look at projecting general fund revenues and our taxes and what we expect to receive in 23, 24 and beyond, we look at our economy. The Scottsdale economy remains really strong. We continue to have population growth. Even though we are a smaller piece of the total state pie, our population is still growing. We have low unemployment rate, 2.4% in December. We have high property values. We have high demand for tourism and event activities. We have strong and a diversified economy. We have our you know, Mayo Clinic, healthcare, financial um, sectors that are doing very, very well. We also have a very high median income, 40% higher than the U.S. average, and our more affluent consumers are less impacted by inflation and rising interest rates. So on the one hand, we may have consumers pulling back on spending, and on the one hand, we may have a slowdown on the economy, but on the other hand, Scottsdale economy is also very strong, so there's some offsetting um, impacts there. Next slide. So this slide is really busy, but I will walk you through it. This is a slide of all our major categories of local sales tax that we collect in the general fund and how we have done in terms of collecting these sales tax since the pre-pandemic 2018 and our projections and forecasts for fiscal year 23, 24 and beyond. And so as you can see, the very top line is miscellaneous retail, that's the Small retails, online sales, that's not our major department stores, but all the miscellaneous retail sales. 
And let me just walk you through this. The next few categories as we walk down these lines, we track rental, that's long-term rental. Other taxable are like wholesale um, and other uh, taxable sales that are not miscellaneous retail and not any of these other categories. And that has grown significantly. We track automotive, we track restaurant, we track construction, major department stores, food stores, and hotel motel. As you can see, you can see the actual dip in the rental, the restaurant, and the hotel motel. That was the start of the pandemic back in the uh, early fiscal year, I mean, end of fiscal year 20, and you can see the uh, pent-up demand and the recovery is almost like a V-shape and the uh, pandemic spending. So you can see all that with these lines, and you can see what's interesting is even though we had significant increases in hotel, motel, restaurant, rental, other taxable, what really drove the significant increase in our sales tax was miscellaneous retail. In fiscal year 21, we saw an 11% increase in our sales tax in the general fund. And then last year in fiscal year 22, we saw a 21% increase in our sales tax. And all that, a lot of that was driven by miscellaneous retail for a couple reasons. One is we talked about the pent up spending, pandemic spending. The other is also because in 2018, the state, uh, the Wayfair decision, the state started taxing online retailers like Etsy, eBay. So some of that increase is also attributable to the online retailers starting to, uh, having to pay taxes. So as you can see, what our projection is balancing the um, um, retraction of the economy, the, the you know, um, pulling back of the spending or the end of the stimulus spending with the strong economy. What we've done is we have projected that our revenues will drop back to a normal growth trend line. So as you can see on the orange, the miscellaneous retail, we basically drop back and eliminate that big hump, bump that we went up from but it's still growing significantly and going back to a normal growth trend line. That's how we are anticipating our revenues will be. Uh, we hope that this is conservative. We will budget accordingly to these revenues. As you know, Council has um, noted, our revenues are uh, still growing. They're still strong because of a strong economy, but they're just not growing at that fast pace and above our normal trend line. We're not anticipating it growing above the normal trend line, and we will have to adjust our expenditures accordingly to the revenues that we project. Um, next slide. On the state shared revenue slide, as you can see, the gray on top is our vehicle license tax, and that has traditionally stayed pretty consistent at 11 to 12 million a year, and we anticipate that will continue that way. The orange bars is our state shared income tax, and we talked about earlier that we're anticipating seeing an increase and then a decrease because it's a two-year lag, and the increase that we're expecting in fiscal year 23-24 and fiscal year 24-25 is reflective of the significant income and individual and corporate tax income tax collections through the pandemic that the state will collect between 21 and 22 that we will receive in 24 and 25. And so with that, we expect those two years to be robust and offset some of the decrease in the sales tax that we will see. And then in the out years, um, we anticipate that income tax to drop back down because of the flat tax. And on the state, state share sales tax, that's those blue bars, we anticipate that the decrease in the state shared sales tax, again, from you know, consumers pulling back on spending, will be offset by any growth that we see in the whole state. So that, we pretty much anticipate it will be flat. Next slide. For property taxes, now property taxes, we are limited by our 2%. Our levy is, uh, by state statute, our levy is limited to 2% growth plus new construction. 
2% growth of our levy is less than a million dollars. So with um, new construction, we have not projected any more than a one or two million increase in our sales tax. I mean, sorry, property tax. And that is the primary property tax that is used for operations in our general fund. We also assess a secondary property tax that's used for debt service. Next slide. So the secondary property tax is used for our uh, general obligation bonds. And this, I just wanted to share that for general obligations bonds, as we promised our taxpayers, we will layer the issuance of our debt so that the property tax rate remains relatively flat. So we're not anticipating issuing any general obligation bonds for our bond 2019 project next year, we will plan on issuing it the following year in 24, 25, and then also in 26, 27, so that we can maintain a relatively flat property tax, secondary property tax. So at this point, I want to pause. Um, I want, uh, this ends my revenue section of my presentation and just wanted to see if there's any questions or comments on the revenues. I see uh, Councilmember Graham and Councilmember Durham. Thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question. You raised my, piqued my interest about the sales tax and the Wayfair decision. Is that where um, the sale happens, the purchase happens, the delivery happens? And how, is that, how has that helped us? Yes. Um, yes. Mayor and Council Member Graham. So, um, trying to find a way to describe this very quickly and easily. So, that has helped us because prior to the Wayfair decision, we are, uh, there needs to be a physical nexus. That means there has to be a brick and mortar um, in order for us to assess a tax. So, uh, like either a uh, building or a delivery truck or people on the ground. So Amazon would be collecting and paying sales tax, but eBay would not because they don't have a building here or people here or delivery trucks here. With the Wayfair decision, that created an economic nexus. So you don't have to have a physical nexus anymore. You just have to have an economic nexus. And so the state statute requires that economic nexus. So now Etsy or any other right. stores elsewhere with an economic nexus. That means they sell products right. to Arizona. But I'm Arizona. saying, I'm, I'm asking, is it where the buyer is for the, uh, or the delivery? The, the buyer would be in Arizona and the delivery would be in Arizona. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Next, Council Member Durham. Thank you. Um, we obviously just had a big month with Super Bowl and, um, other events, uh, Mayor Ortega mentioned the horse show and I was there over the weekend, it was very busy. And this will also be the first full spring training that we've had for a while. Are any of those expected to be significant enough to make any bumps in the revenue? Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, Vice Mayor Durham, um, I was just looking at our January tax collections and there was a slight uptick in it, but nothing significant. I mean, maybe like three million. Usually, when we have a Super Bowl year or a, you know a strong year, it adds about three, four million to our general fund, but not like ten plus million or anything like that. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, and move on, okay. please. Um, so, next slide. So, I wanted to talk about expenditures, pension, and debt. Next slide. Um, with expenditures, as you can see, citywide, personnel expenditures, our salaries, our people are our biggest assets. It's 41% of our city. Contracts, and we, you know, that's a pretty significant part of our city expenses too. We have to contract for a lot of services. That's 30% of our expenditures. We have debt service at 15%, commodities at 7%. When we look at the general fund, because the general fund has most of our personnel, which is public safety, uh, parks and rec, and public works, and all our administrative staff, it's 68% of the general fund is our personnel expenditures. And uh, contracts makes up 22% of the general fund. Next slide. 
So what do we expect from the expenditure side for 23-24 labor costs? We are still working with the city manager. He has not made a decision on merit, step, and market yet, so we're still making decisions on that. We have looked at our health care cost increase. We have our benefits consultant providing us estimates of anywhere from 7 to 9% on the health care cost increase. Retirement costs, we will continue to pay down on our PSPRS liability, and I'll talk more about the retirement in a bit. And we're also looking at new position requests, which the city manager is still looking through and making decisions on. For contracts and commodities, we talked about this a uh, little earlier. We are looking at seeing a lot of inflation on our contracts and commodities, anywhere from um, 15 to 30 percent, and insurance premium increases. We're also seeing a lot of requests for technology and software upgrades as we try to modernize the city, and we're also seeing re equipment replacements. And as far as new operating costs, we are not really bringing any new programs necessarily to the city, but what we're seeing is operating costs for new capital projects are coming online, like for example, the multi-use sports fields. So we have operating costs on these new capital projects that we will be bringing into our fiscal year 23-24 budget. And all the additional requests, are a lot of it is to really keep up with demand. All right, next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our public safety uh, retirement plan. We have been working hard under the city manager's um, direction to reduce the liability. And he started this even before I started, and uh, really um, uh, kudos to him. So in um, this year, we received our valuation, our police uh, pension plan. The remaining liability is $157 million and our fire pension plan, our PSPRS for fire, the remaining liability is only 25 million. So the police plan is 64% funded, and the fire plan is now 86% funded. And for our contribution rates, for 2023, for the police plan, we were at 63% of salaries, and this year, because we've paid down on that police plan, it's down to 59%. But because we're going to make an effort to continue paying it down, we will budget at the 63%. For fire, because of the change in their um, actuarial um, factors, it actually went up from 23% to 25%, even though the liability has gone down to $25 million. And as far as additional contributions, if you remember in 2022, we made an extra 35 million of additional contributions for police, an additional 5 million for fire. This year, we made an additional 10 million, and we're still talking with the city manager on what we should do as additional contributions from, for 2024. So I really wanted to let you know that we are working very hard on reducing our uh, pension PSPRS liability. Next slide. Um, for the non-public safety um, personnel, they are, we are under ASRS, and that plan is a pooled plan. We're not individually valued. We are part of the pool for the whole state. That plan is 73% funded, and, and the contribution rate really didn't change much this year. Next slide. And... Um, as far as debt issuances, for 2023, the only debt issuance we're planning on is about $25 million for the transfer station for our solid waste. So that's the only debt that we're planning for. And in future years, as we talked about, we will issue more of the bond 2019 debt and also some water sewer debt. Next slide. And this last slide I really uh, put together to uh, let folks know, because not a lot of people understand and know this, but uh, we are subject to what we call expenditure limitation. Basically, in 1980, the voters approved under the uh, state constitution that limits our expenditure of local revenues to no more than inflation plus population growth. So as we put our budget together, we're always paying attention to our expenditure limitation. 
Our expenditure limitation for this fiscal year, as you see on the slide in the middle column, is $542.5 million, and we are, uh, we are estimating that we'll end the year with $489.7 million of spending of our local revenues, and then next um, fiscal year, we've already been given what our expenditure limitations are. It is $585.8 million, and as we put our budget together, our expenditures for for uh, local revenues will have to stay under that. And that ends my expenditure slides. I can um, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, I see none, so continue. Uh, okay, right. Council Member Graham, again on expenditures. Yes, Please. thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the expenditures, does that include like flow through for federal or state? Is that when that comes through us? That's kind of a basic question, but I'm just, do you mean on the this expenditure limitation? Yeah. Oh, no, it does not. This is just expenditure limitation on local revenues. Local so it revenue does, sources. Okay. Yes, local revenue sources. So it does not include all the federal grants or everything that flows through. Correct. It does not. Okay. Thank you. Good, and I, I will go back a couple of years. It was um, very wise that the city manager. Uh, kept a separate account for the CARES funds and other recovery funds. So rather than blending them with our full budget, some cities did do sort of some blending, but it was accounted for in a very responsible way. So continue with the next portion. Thank you. Okay. So my last slide, next slide, please. My last slide is just to share with you the timeline for our budget. Tonight I'm, I've provided a preliminary outlook um, our public works director will share with you an outlook for our CIP side of the budget. In March, we will hear from the departments on our proposed rates and fees. April 4th is when we plan to release our proposed budget and CIP for fiscal year 23-24. And um, April 25, we will present that budget to the council and between May and June will be all the final adoption of the budget, rates, fees, CIP, and the property tax levies. That ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll mo move on to the next uh, piece, which uh, has to do with the um, um, capital improvement plan updates. And we have uh, Dan Worth, our public's, uh, public works director. Hello. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I am here to give you a look at a work in progress, uh, a snapshot view of where we are with the development of our fiscal year 23-24 CIP. I want to start by warning you, I've got a lot of information, a lot of slides, 43 of them to be precise. And uh, if you do the math, I did the math because I'm an engineer, I can't help it. If I spend two minutes on each slide, you're going to be listening to me for an hour and a half and I'm sure nobody wants that. Apparently the mayor wants that. But uh, so I'm going to go through some of these pretty quickly. But obviously, if I need to stop and elaborate on anything, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, this is where we're at, our timeline. Uh, all the things in yellow are things that have happened. All the things in white at the bottom are things that are going to happen. Uh, what has happened is the departments have developed their needs and submitted requests to the budget office. Staff has gone through evaluations. Uh, prioritized the project requests, presented those to the city manager, gotten his input. We've now got a draft of a prioritized project list, which you'll be seeing later in this presentation. Uh, the things in white, uh, the first one is what we're doing right now. Uh, and then there are several other opportunities for uh, input and uh, changes to the proposed CIP before we get the final adoption. This is just to uh, kind of put the what we're talking about tonight in the perspective, we've got a billion dollar plus uh, annual CIP. I'm gonna spend 95% of the presentation tonight talking about uh, a quarter of that. Uh, the two wedges at the bottom of the chart, general fund and geo bonds. Primarily I'm talking about general fund. Uh, that's, that's where much of the decisions have to be made about uh, uh, competing needs across different departments. Uh, the GEO bonds, I'm going to be talking about indirectly because several of the requests are for additional general fund funding or additional funding to be able to complete uh, GEO bond projects. As I go through the presentation, um, I'm going to be uh, including a few pictures to show some of the things that we've done 
uh, over the past year, just to, uh, to bring some attention to them. And the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of those things that are in this year's CIP, just to, to kind of give you a, a rough idea of the kinds of things that we've been doing and are still doing before we get into the, uh, the depths of what we uh, hope to do in the future. Uh, this picture is the uh, new projects. You can see the lighting and the bollards that we installed in the entertainment district prior to uh, uh, Super Bowl week, and uh, they were very successful. And uh, you can see uh, some dollar figures, about $100 million uh, in general fund uh, CIP spending broke up into different categories. Uh, here are two of them. Uh, the annual projects, sometimes you hear these referred to as Y projects. Uh, that's the convention that we use in the CIP to identify the, the uh, annual projects. We add funding to them each year. There's five years of funding in each one of these projects. Uh, these are the projects where we're taking care of existing assets, both buildings and uh, information technology assets. Um, the second group, technology and equipment, um, is things that... Uh, uh, primarily on the IT side, but we're also getting into uh, buying some equipment. I'm going to talk about that uh, with regards to fire equipment and regards to fleet uh, purchases uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, the picture is Indian School Park uh, Field 1, which was a bond project, but also had some general fund funding allocated to it. This is a list of existing, in the budget now, general fund projects. Uh, these are all bond projects that have a general fund component to them. Uh, in some cases, these were decisions that you made, uh, specific decisions uh, based on quotes that we were getting, based on uh, GMP proposals where we needed to add funding. So, uh, so we brought them to you, and, uh, and you made decisions to allocate additional money. Uh, some of these, we added money to them right up front because they included some non-bond eligible expenses, things that couldn't be capitalized, and and uh, uh, but we're part of the delivery of the project. And I will point out the third line down, the new fire department training facility, uh, that number increased as a result of the action that you took last week. Uh, it was five million, as we discussed at length uh, a week ago, it was five million that was added to the uh, CIP budget this year and you added the additional 10 million as a result of the action last week. The picture is another one of those bond projects where we had a significant um, general fund add. The Civic Center Plaza, this is the uh, East Bowl of the Civic Center Plaza project in progress. Uh, second slide, uh, actually I've got uh, two slides that I'm going to show you of straight up general fund projects. Some of these have uh, multiple funding sources, but uh, most of these are, are uh, all or largely general fund projects. Uh, the picture is um, what we refer to as gateway monuments. That's the third uh, bullet or the third line on the chart. Uh, we had the old uh, Welcome to Scottsdale signs that were dated and actually kind of plain. Uh, we worked in collaboration with Scottsdale Arts to bring in an artist who uh, actually did an artist competition. Uh, and this was the, uh, the winning selection. Um, they designed, fabricated this past year. We had uh, signs up to replace the old signs uh, where the old signs existed at uh, different entry points into Scottsdale. Uh, you're going to see a request later in the presentation for additional funding for this project. That would be primarily to put signs at places that they didn't previously exist to expand the project, but uh, we're pretty excited with how that came out and uh, presented a good picture uh, for visitors over the past couple of weeks. Uh, general fund projects, uh, second list the two lists total $65 million construction projects currently in the general fund CIP. Um, this is obviously a picture not of a finished project, but of the Chaparral pool renovation in process. So that's stuff that we're working on now. The rest of the presentation is going to focus on stuff that we're looking at for the 23-24 CIP. Um, this shows, and this is very similar to a slide that I showed you last November when we talked about uh, CIP. This shows all the different types of projects that, uh, that we're considering, uh, and we prioritize all these together, but I'm going to show you a list for each one of these. I'm going to show you details of those annual projects, the department submissions, and requests to add funding to bond projects. These are the annual projects, and I briefly mentioned those a moment ago. These are the 
um, projects where we fund money in each year of the five-year plan. So as we move into a new budget, a new CIP, we're generally adding year five. Uh, and the first two of these are facilities projects taking care of buildings, major equipment replacements, uh, roof replacements, major capital items uh, as, as part of our buildings. Uh, the rest of them are primarily information technology and communications equipment, but the same thing, we've got an asset, we need to refresh the asset. Um, this, these projects uh, budget money each year to do that. Most of this request is for adding a fifth year. Uh, there are two exceptions. The first one, FCA is facility condition assessments. This is um, uh, a process that we use to go through and evaluate all of our major buildings and identify needs. Uh, this is actually asking for three years of funding at two million each because we didn't fully fund five years last year. Uh, so that's uh, more than just year five. And then the last one, parking lot pavement, is new. Uh, so we're, we're adding multiple years on that one. Mayor. Uh, thank you. And we'll pause here. There's a question or comment from Councilwoman Janik. Um, thank you, Mayor. Question on the CIP GF projects, current aquatics lifestyle re life cycle replacement, is that an annual amount to keep all of our pools functional? It doesn't fluctuate much. You're referring back to uh, this, I believe? Yeah, line one. That yeah. was a multiple year request, uh, and they are stepping through improvements at each of the aquatics facilities. Okay, so it's four it, million it, plus each year? No, or? this is the total five year. And, okay. and there's not an additional funding request for this. This is not one of those why projects. This was a one-time project spread out over multiple years. Okay, and then it's kind of the same question on the slide we're at right now. Um, approved five-year general fund. Is it linear that it's the same amount every year for five years, or does it wax and wane depending upon the need or what stage you're at of the project? This one, each of these projects has funding in each of the five years and it's need dependent. Facilities is taking, uh, actually has a list of anticipated life cycle equipment replacements year by year. So okay. the amount varies based on what the anticipated need is, the specific need. Okay, and IT you. does the same thing. Thank you. Um, Council Member Graham. This is, thank you, Mayor. This has been explained, but can you re-explain um, the, the why nomenclature, just so I understand that shibboleth? I think it's totally arbitrary. Uh, it, it's a convention that we came up with as, yeah. as we, every project has a five but, but or four what, digit. Right, what, is it, what does it mean again? It, I can't tell you what the abbreviation is, but it means a project that is, yeah. is rebudgeted every year with an additional fifth year. And we've, we've also referred to them as the keep the lights on projects. These are yeah. things that we need to take care of existing so, assets. Oh, so when, I see, when we see why, that means, that means just one more year of ongoing costs? Yes. Okay. Um, this, um, I'll just, we kind of talked about this a little bit in our briefing earlier today. Councilmember uh, Whitehead was there, but I, I think it would be very illuminating. Um, I, it's, it's hard to follow some of these projects because I don't know, I don't know what what the what the prior year from just when I sit here and look at these very granular lists, I don't know what was approved in a prior budget in a CIP. I don't know what the sources of those funds for the project were at one point, and if that's changed. I don't know. I can't tell if, if there's, you know, if there's an override or under or, you know, underwrite of the budget. There's, it's just a single dollar symbol. It doesn't really tell me a whole lot. Is that, is that something that can, what, what do you think about that? We can, we can add information to, uh, to a presentation like this, certainly, and I know that the earlier discussion you were focusing on the, uh, the bond projects when you asked that question. Yeah. That, I, I didn't show the original bond amounts, but uh, yeah. all the information is available in the published CIP. You can look oh, at I, each project. Yeah, no, I know it's out there. I just, yeah. for these types of presentations, especially when, you know, you think about the limited attention span of the, of the public, for them to be able to, to kind of see this and give it a little more context and uh, dimensionality and longitudinality. Otherwise, it just doesn't seem to, just seems to be like a, a name of a project and a number. So I, th I think it's something to consider going forward. 
Thank sure. you, Mayor. Thank you. And continuing. Uh, moving on, those were the uh, annual Keep the Lights On projects. These are new projects identified by departments, actually a fairly short list. Uh, technology projects on the left, equipment projects. Equipment is largely related to uh, fire department and uh, some of these specifically, the certificate of necessity is, is equipment purchases uh, in the uh, event that we establish an ambulance service. So this would be in support of that. Just another real brief entry to that. Uh, all these items are over 50,000 and require the general procurement that we would normally have. I know the subject of procurement came up at one point, but typically these are, you know, to keep the lights on and to continue those, those duties. Okay, I, I'm just making a note of that, you know. Uh, go ahead. And then um, that's technology and equipment projects. This is new requests for construction projects. And you'll see these again on the prioritized project list. I'm not gonna go through these in any amount of detail, uh, but just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the request, about $226, or $226 million worth of construction projects were included in that request. And you can see some, some fairly big ticket items, especially towards the bottom of the list that account for a lot of that. This is also a fairly short list, general fund CIP needs, where we're asking for increases to existing projects. And again, these will appear on a prioritized list um, later in the discussion. Th thank you. I see Councilwoman Littlefield. Uh, sorry, uh, Whitehead. Whitehead. Yeah, I just, I'll be really quick, and, and Dan already knows this. Uh, we had previously discussed splitting the cost of the Pima Road sound wall into transportation and general fund. So I just want to get that out there for um, consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Continue. And then a small number of projects are still left over from the process that we went through in 2019 when we developed the projects that made it onto the bond uh, election list. Um, we started that process a year prior with $730 million worth of projects. We whittled it down through public outreach and through council direction to uh, half of that, $319 million. But there were some things that didn't make the list that are still requirements. And some of those were represented by, uh, by requests for, uh, for funding in this CIP. And uh, you can see what those are. And again, some of these are big ticket items, the uh, power line undergrounding in particular. And then the last group of projects that we have as um, general fund requests are additional funding needed for bond 2019 projects. Uh, and I'm going to uh, go into uh, some detail on that. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about inflation. Excuse me. Um, we'll have uh, Councilwoman Janik. Um, quick question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you have a project list. Do projects ever get totally dropped if they're on it for five years and the money is never found? Does it get dropped or does it just go on forever? Um, I, the answer is yes. I mean, projects, I, I, I am very aware of projects that have been requested. They've been through uh, proposed bond election processes and, and they've dropped. Oh. Uh, these particular projects, um, there's, there's still identified needs for the uh, the park and the playground equipment and the community services long-term plan uh, and there's still a desire to, uh, to underground power lines in the Scottsdale Road corridor because of its value to the uh, to the resort industry okay, uh, and its scenic nature so thank you maybe they don't ever get funded but uh, but there's still identified lists there's still merit to them okay, thank you thank you I see Councilwoman Caputi uh, just real quick on that slide because I think it's super important just to underscore what you just said. So we put, we, you know, originally started with a $730 million that we identified that had to happen in our city. And, and we whittled that down to 319, but those other many tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of projects that need to be done in our city don't go away. So I just want to remind everyone those are still out there looming, looking for funding. Thank you. Thank you, and, and with new projects comes new M&O, operating and maintenance. So 
all of that side also you know, as we see this pool here. For one thing to say that you know we may want three more pools or there may be a need for that, but we have to have the accompanying operating budget to, to maneuver that. Uh, Councilmember Graham? Oh, I, I missed press. Oh, excuse me. Were you voting already? No. <laughs> I vote. Okay. Continue. Uh, thank you. Um, continue, okay. Dan. And, and uh, Mayor, thank you for mentioning the pool. I, uh, uh, the, the picture is Cactus Pool, and this is a future bond project that we, uh, we hope to, uh, to execute to replace this pool, a, a more modern facility. Um, as I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about inflation. I know uh, the topic came up during our discussion last week on the uh, fire training facility. Uh, there was some question about the index that we're using and the 46% number that's out there. Um, so we took a look at, uh, at the index and uh, based on some direction I got from, uh, from um, uh, Sonia Andrews after she talked with some of you, uh, I'm showing a different index. Uh, this is also produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's a uh, part of their suite of indexes uh, they refer to as the producer price index. The one that I used in November uh, was a producer price index for final demand construction. This one is more specific to government construction. Uh, and I used a different starting point for this chart. Uh, in November, I showed you a starting point of January 2018, and I was showing you increases relative to that date. And I used January 2018 because we did estimates uh, for many of the projects that are in the bond to support this process in 2018, to support the CIP development process. So they were done in January and February of 2018 and submitted for the 18-19 CIP. And if they didn't make it, then they were submitted as, as projects to consider for the 2019 bond election. So some of those estimates go back to the beginning of 2018. That's why I use that uh, starting point. But if you want to be extra conservative, this is a more focused index, shows a, a slightly lower uh, inflation rate than the general index, which astounds me because government always costs more. Uh, I don't know why it's lower, but, uh, but it is. It's, it's the, the federal government, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I, I have to trust it. 18.4% uh, year-over-year increase last summer compared to the 22% that I was showing you uh, in November. Still high, still twice the rate of CPI inflation. Uh, but a little different take. Um, and just for the sake of completeness, this chart shows both. This chart shows the uh, government construction is the red line, the final demand construction that I used last November uh, is the, the gray line, and you can see the consumer price index from the same organization, Bureau of Labor Statistics, for comparison. This shows the January 19 uh, starting period. Um, they're both showing that inflation is, is pretty significant, uh, at least twice as high as the, uh, the overall uh, inflation in the economy as, as reflected by the CPI. And in November, I also showed you some specific commodity charts. I'm uh, updating and uh, re-showing you three of them here. Uh, steel products, uh, milled steel. Uh, this is fairly representative of a lot of commodities. Uh, in the 20, late 2021 time frame, it jumped. That's when a lot of these increases happened. That's when you saw that 18.9% year-over-year increase. Uh, it showed up in the summer of 22, but it was happening for that previous year. Um, and you can see we were up over 100% uh, over January of 2019. It's come down. It's stabilizing, apparently but not at the level that it was in 2019. It's still 40% above that level, so it's still a pretty significant increase. And we see this for, for many commodities that are in that index. Uh, Dan, I see a request from Vice Mayor Littlefield. Is that correct? Okay, so uh, uh, please go ahead, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Littlefield. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I'm the only one left on the council who was on the original Bond committee from the council, uh, Guy Phillips, Dan Clapp, and myself. And one of the hardest decisions we had to make while we were on that bond committee was determining which projects to put on uh, the bond for a vote for the people and which to cut. Because there were so many things that we needed to do. And it was uh, actually quite extensively 
reviewed by the citizens of Scottsdale. We had open houses throughout all of Scottsdale where people came and we took their discussed their, their ideas or what they wanted, what they thought was more important or something else. And we took all of those ideas and the staff uh, put them together and presented them to us so that they gave us the guiding line as to what we put on the bond. But there were a lot of projects that a lot of people wanted that we had to not put on the bond just because we didn't want it to be so large that, that it was overwhelming. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that need to be done. And I uh, hope that uh, over the next few years, perhaps we can consolidate some of those ideas into a package that would be considered important enough to go to the later. Thank you. So thank you, um, Vice Mayor Littlefield. You, you've, uh, you've served the longest, and you have... Uh, experience the roller coaster and as these choices are made uh, we appreciate that insight continue uh, point of uh, order uh, or point of privilege mayor could you understand what vice mayor was saying and uh, give about, a summary about half of it because she yeah. was referring to yeah. choices made uh, what i will suggest is that our own city it look and go and test and perhaps swap out some equipment uh, but uh, I heard uh, the tone of okay. saying that okay. they were uh, they were there. And again, we, how it's focused in this room and reflects is a little bit difficult. Uh, okay. Okay. But, but that was the gist of why I try to repeat that <laughs> a bit. Um, continue. A uh, couple more of the commodity slides. This is electrical equipment, transformers, large switch gear. Um, and this is something that we see with a lot of the long lead uh, custom fabricated type things. Uh, they've gone up substantially and maybe stabilized, but haven't come down at all. Uh, so those are still, and this is a major cost in, in pretty much any new building that we're building. This is my glimmer of hope slide. Uh, asphalt, I, I try not to be totally pessimistic. <laughs> but uh, asphalt peaked at over 100% increase above um, January 2019. It's come way down. Uh, you can see at the, uh, the far right end, it's bouncing back up. Uh, but uh, it's not too far from January 2019 levels. It also shows you that asphalt is tied to fuel prices, to oil prices. Uh, as, as the price for diesel comes down, asphalt comes down. As it goes back up, asphalt goes up, and we expect to see that continue. Uh, but one thing that I will point out is that a lot of the, a lot of the contracts that we have, see them at risk contracts, um, if we bid here and the project is delivered down here where it costs less, we get the savings, uh, just the nature of that kind of a contract. So that's, that could be a potential success for us. So, uh, and again, bond 2019 projects, we're asking for more money. Uh, I'm trying to be positive. This is a list of projects where we're not asking for more money. Uh, some of these already have uh, more money allocated to them um, in previous decisions that, uh, that were on one of the previous charts. But, uh, but these are, are tracking. Uh, we hope to execute them and uh, uh, do it with the resources that we have allocated to them right now. So, shortfall for projects, I'm going to show you two slides. This is projects that are in design and construction. We have uh, estimates from a design consultant or we have GMP proposals and we need more money. I do want to point out number 42, which is the uh, dog park and does consist of significant parking that's required, which includes asphalt, which is a good thing. And that one was moved forward and it's on track. So I see, I see number 42. Continue. And, and many of these projects, if they're gonna move forward, you can see uh, the fiscal year of execution in the right-hand column. Um, if it's 22, 23, if they're gonna move forward, we're gonna need to find the money. Um, so, so they become a higher need. Uh, these projects, not so much. These are projects where we had requests for additional funding, but they're in the out years. So we've got some time to wrestle with it. And these aren't generally the result of uh, design consultant estimates or contractor bid proposals. These are just applying our escalation factors that we talked about last November. So 
uh, really not a high priority need to move forward with these. And then these are projects where there was no request, uh, just for the sake of completeness, another $35 million if you use the escalation factors that we talked about last November uh, and apply them to these remaining projects. Thank you, Councilwoman Janik, and then Councilwoman Whitehead. Okay, quick question, Bond, tw thank you, Mayor. 2019 shortfalls, um, the general fund request is the amount of shortfall. It's the difference between what it, we thought it would be and what we had and what we now need. Correct. That is okay. the actual amount that's requested as part of the budget process to make okay. the project whole. Thank you. Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilmember Grant. Uh, one of the things that we discussed, I just want to share with my colleagues or anybody who's still listening from the public, <laughs> is that many of these projects we can um, extend and do in, uh, like for instance, the barns, maybe we do one barn one year and then put out the net following year. So um, I do think we have to be careful about overspending. Um, so I'm, I'd, I'd definitely be looking at uh, which parts of these projects we can do that we can extend out to future years while still getting the core part of the project done. Councilmember Graham. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so in this particular one, Dan, it would be nice if like there was, um, you know, an amount, this because these are all bond 2019 authorizations. Correct. The amount that um, was in the bond, a column for that, column for the request, um, assuming that general fund request, is, that's the only source request, um, maybe a percentage variance so we could kind of see, I mean, like what's the total amount from, what's total project amount for project 18, for example, in bond 2019? I mean, I have to, we have to go kind of look it up and, you know, find it. And so you just, without even knowing that, though, $20 million appears to be uh, a staggering amount of over of overrun and so um, it, I guess just some more of those columns and uh, some more you know some more some more context thank you uh, mayor council member Graham uh, I, I certainly appreciate the uh, the input we'll we'll look to do that in the future to so project number 18 um, that is actually an exception uh, the bond amount was 1.85 million we didn't anticipate that it was going to build anything close to the concept that we presented to council a year ago for the second street streetscape. We always anticipated that we were going to have to find additional funding to be able to actually build this project. This was okay. primarily so intended to get us a, a concept and, uh, and to get started on the, design. So the bond project 18, that just, that said 1.8 million? That was approved by the voters yeah. for 1.85. So this, that's, but that was like, I'm sure the language was crafted that you know, it's not like a bait and switch, you know, it's clearly like part of a bigger project. Honestly, I can't tell you that that would be subject to interpretation, but uh, I can okay. uh, I can provide you the language if, if you're interested. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the lesson is some things can toggle back and forth, but basically, you know, our general uh, uh, general account has a checkbook that can 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 uh, cover some costs and you are responsible for filing all that stuff. The other thing that I would just add is that we do not compromise on durability or quality. This is a situation where, you know, in the free market or somebody will say, well, we're going to use cheaper materials and the, 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 the life of that. We build institutional grade. We build the top grade that you can uh, expect. It will have depreciation and it will, uh, you know, erode, corrode over time and need to be replaced or modernized. But I think that's, in our discussion, what, what was important to me, uh, that we're not going to downgrade uh, uh, the life expectancy necessarily or the, the service life to our, especially our public safety sector. We're not going to build half a jail or uh, skimp on something that we... Uh, we have to uh, maintain that quality. Uh, go ahead, Dan, continue. <clears throat> so those are all the uh, gory details of the project requests from the, the different departments. This is the summary. 
Uh, you can see the different categories, the annual projects, the department submissions broken down into different categories, the bond 2019 shortfalls. Add them all together, $465 million worth of requests. We take those requests and match them up against the funds available. Uh, and this is an abbreviated version of the, uh, the cash flow analysis that we do to determine how much funds are available. Uh, basically, it's a five-year analysis. You start with a balance, you add funds, and the second and third line are by policy. We add 50% of construction sales tax revenues. We add uh, interest uh, earnings over a million dollars. Um, so starting balance, there are additions. Some of these are one-time additions. This is this year. We made one-time additions this year with funds that were available. Uh, certainly an option going forward. But what we know right now, uh, we've got a cash available at the end of each year. We've got budgeted expenditures, everything that's in the CIP now in the bottom half of that chart. You take the cash available, you subtract out the budgeted expenditures, you have a cash balance at the end of the year. The cash balance carries forward to the beginning balance for the next year. And in the lower right-hand corner, I haven't added any of the fiscal year 27-28 stuff yet. Uh, lower right-hand corner, that tells you how much money we ostensibly have, 60.5 million, to be able to uh, add projects to the general fund CIP. So that's the number. We take the $465 million worth of projects, the $60.5 million worth of funds, uh, we take those projects, apply our prioritization criteria. These are, I uh, showed these to you in November. These are in the CIP book. Uh, this was developed uh, through a process with the council subcommittee uh, in 2000, uh, as, as we prepared for the bond election, actually 2018 timeframe. We apply these criteria, come up with what we think the prioritized list is. And this slide and the next three slides show you the results of that prioritization process. The first slide, if you look at this, I've got the projects um, identified. I can't get my cursor to work. Projects identified in this column. Uh, the CMRC is the Capital Management Review Committee. That's our prioritization number. Uh, the amount of the request, and I've got a running total. So the first project, this is one of those Y projects, facility condition assessments, refreshing our buildings, $6 million. Uh, running total, $6 million. If we go to the next project and add that, I've got a running total that's bumped up by $2.5 right on down the list. So you take a look in the priority order, you add projects, you increase that running total until you get down to $56 million. I've got $60.5 million available. The next project puts us over that number. So these are the projects that are above the funding line as it stands right now. The next three slides show you the projects that didn't make it. Uh, still in priority sequence, these are the ones that almost made it. Uh, I'm gonna show you a slide that shows the next ones and then the, the real long shots. But uh, just uh, a, a general uh, observation, uh, we're looking for direction. If you have any, any desire to find a way to fund projects that aren't funded according to this list, there's, there's basically two ways that we can do it. One is to um, move the line down further to add more money, uh, and, and that's a possibility. There's some ways that we can do that. Um, the other is to change the sequence, to, uh, to tell us we got the prioritization wrong and move something up and something else down. But if we move something up, something else has to move down. Uh, so those are the two things that can happen in broad terms. More money, change the sequence. Uh, the more money, um, there are several things that we can look at. One is one-time funds from the general fund. We're not prepared yet to say how much or if that's, that's a possibility uh, because we still have to go through what Sonia laid out on the operating side, all that general fund budget development, and we still have some significant unknowns on the legislative side that could affect our tax revenues. Uh, but that is one source of more money. Uh, there are others. Uh, we have um, uh, some available revenue from the tourism fund, from the bed tax that could be applied if it's a tourism related project and we're looking at that as a potential source. Uh, in a few moments I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, Bell Road land sales proceeds. We still have to figure out what to do with half of that money. We already resolved the restricted funds. There's unrestricted funds and if we use some of those unrestricted funds for things that are budgeted, 
in the CIP, you free up general fund. So that's a way of adding more money. So there are some possibilities of doing that. Wow. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilmember Graham. Okay, so on this list, all the items, I'm, I take out all the um, public service. Oh, we're on slide this one. You want to go down to? Uh, the, the ones that make the cut? So, yeah, so. The ones that didn't make the cut. No, put the ones that did make the cut. Thank you. I forgot that not everybody can read my mind. So, um, okay, so if you take out all the public safety stuff, you end up with everything on this slide is in the north, from McCormick Ranch to Thompson Peak Dog Park to um, the new park, uh, where did it go? Ashler Hills. So, um, so if you go down to, so I definitely don't see, um, I think, uh, Councilman Graham called it South Parity going on here. So what I would recommend, um, and, and to do some smaller projects, if you go to the next page, um, that second street that's you know bigger than what was planned, that um, the staff is looking to get a grant, let's you know cross our fingers, but if you knock that one down, because we're trying to get a grant, you can add um, pickleball courts, I would say that would be my first bump up pickleball courts at Pima Park for a mere three million. Um, there's the shade and tree development plan, also three million. We get that as something that really unites this community and there is the new park downtown for two million. So I think that those, we need to bump in, I, you know, I'm not firm on these except for the pickleball, that we just need to put some south above the line of what's funded then I would say we could bump out the, um, this is based on that Chief Shannon's not here to catch me if I'm misstating what I believe to be true. Bump further out number 34 on that um, third page, the, the fire station at 90th Street in Via Linda, and put some of the um, McCormick Ranch stuff uh, with tourism dollars. Those are just some general ideas I have. Excellent. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. And it, this is why we're having this dialogue for, uh, you know, uh, continue Council Member Graham and then Council Member Durham. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Tangentially, yeah, uh, I guess geographic parity is nice. We have done some projects in the south of recently, Civic Center, and, but it's nice to see that parity. Um, can you uh, can you explain to us, uh, Dan? And I, one other thing, could we, if we could put slide numbers on these, then I could make easy reference to went with my colleagues, and then we could say, you know, well, this slide is just a just as a sidebar. Uh, can you explain what connectivity initiative is again for 17 million? Uh, that does not have a defined scope. Uh, it is money that we set aside that could potentially be used for. Uh, several things in the downtown area that uh, provide connections to the amenities and to the employment centers in the downtown's area uh, and, and the surrounding area. The reason I ask is because um, the, the slide, it's page 47 of the packet, it's the CIP development available funds. I don't know how else to get there, but it's, it's that cash flow statement you put together yeah. Yeah, it just kind of sticks out, you know, $17 million. And you said it's undefined, but it's got a down to the dollar estimation. I, I think that was a calculation that was done based on the proceeds from the Museum Square oh, land sale. Okay, very so, good. So we took out a portion of that for the Stage Brush Theater right, general fund okay. portion and the So we're going to spend whatever's in there. Yeah. And but what kind of what kind of projects do you think might be housed in that number? That's a a significant number. That is money that we could potentially use for that second street, uh, second street streetscape project. Uh, there are some other things that we've been looking at that uh, that would fit the same description for okay. providing connectivity, bikeway uh, okay. master plan that we did for the I, downtown area. All right, I've got concerns about some of those projects that you know they threatened to take away some of our parking spots in the downtown area. So what we're proposing here is uh, for the second street streetscape is the segment east of Scottsdale Road where parking really isn't an issue. 
This is east of Scottsdale Road through the okay. city center. Um, on just just the generally, wash. just I'm yeah. I'm interested in exactly what's in there. So thank you. Um, the uh, and it's funny because all the pro all the projects that we see, all the prices that we see in this listing, that's going to go up again in a year, in a two, in a you know two years from now. It's such a moving target, and it's like the it's just. It's just the construction, I, I, when I worked in state government 15 years ago, it was like, you know, hair on fire, construction, inflation, <laughs> it was the same story. I know we're in a different, unique time period now. When we do our estimates, yeah. Um, our, capital, just, yeah. Yeah, our capital one. project staff, we have an estimator, he's looking at all of these projects, yeah. and he's adding an escalation factor based on the anticipated year of construction. So if it's a project that we anticipate is going to be two years in, in development and right. design, he's adding escalation factor to get so, us to that point. Okay, so he's, he's saying if we, built the, if we built the bridge today for a million, but we know that they're not going to start building in five years, we're going to multiply 1.17. Right. And, so and we did that with the bonds in 2018, and we got nowhere close. We, we did that, and the escalation fact, well, we didn't actually. Uh, if we did that, we would have used escalation factors that yeah. were consistent with the inflation that we were seeing at the time, right. which was the 1% to 3% right. range. Inflation then and was. five okay. years later, your project's inflated 15%. Yeah. We built a 20% contingency into each project. It still probably would have been good, uh, but that's yeah. not what happened. Yeah. Um, the... So w w with the bonds, we can't, it's like every, every bond project is a bucket. So it's like you can't just borrow the money and say we can't do that project, but we'll do these two projects, right? Because every project you have to, you have to is that, that's how it works, correct? You, you can actually. Uh, the, if, if we do not do a project yeah. that's in a question, one of the three questions, Yes. We oh, can so that, potentially okay. reallocate that funding to another project that's in that question. That was my concern about borrowing and then projects that we couldn't get uh, funded. But you're saying anything within a bond question, we can just borrow money and, and, and allocate it across those, correct? Well, I'm not sure borrow is the term, but you can reallocate, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the last thing was the Roundhouse, uh, the McCormick Roundhouse. This, this one right here on this, actually, this particular one, it says McCormick Stillman, McCormick Stillman Roundhouse for 3.6 million. We were, is, that's just the, that's just the general fund component, right? Because that was that was estimated to cost like eight million dollars. That was in the CIP for this year at seven million and change, almost yeah. eight million dollars. Right. Uh, we had that allocated uh, against the restricted funds for the Bell Road land sale. The action you took last week removed that from those restricted Correct. funds. It reverts back to general fund. That hasn't changed. It's still funded for seven million and changed general fund. Yeah. This is a request for an additional three and a half. So that's the overage. That's the overrun, right? Yes. Or the increase, you might call it. Increase. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Council Member Durham. Thank you, Mayor. Um, some of these are kind of obvious on their face what they're discussing, but some of them are not. Um, is there some kind of a source that we could turn to that would give us additional details on what all these are and, and what the case is for each of them? We do have a project database that has detailed scope information, and in the past we've uh, made that available to you in a, in a a uh, summarized form so that you can see what each of these projects um, are, are specifically proposing. We can certainly do that. Yeah, if you could do that, I think that would be very helpful on, on some of these because 90-day uh, backups, I, do, I don't know what that is. The uh, technology projects, I couldn't even explain them to you. So, right. yes, we can make that information available I, to you. Yeah, if you could do that, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, and, and Dan, just because I'll, and speaking of McCormick Railroad Park, McCormick Stillman Railroad Park, we did get a substantial million dollar contribution. The people who are, you know, who are very dedicated are even proposing more. So, you know, that's how the community, let's say, um, instills a, uh, a buy-in, and we know it's, uh, it's funded by additional private sector money. And that's a credit to the team working together. 
they also said we want things to move forward quickly and that that was uh, also a positive uh, rather than saying well we're going to hold off all our money and till the end uh, they they really stepped forward okay continue and and, and we'll finish mayor up. thank you for making that point uh, that is one of our prioritization criteria as well if we're leveraging other people's money million dollars from the railroad society it ranks higher so it's important um, my next slide was to give you the opportunity to talk about that list, which I think we've just done. Good. Good. Um, the next group of slides uh, shifts gears a little bit to talk about the Bell Road uh, land sale proceeds. When we talked in November, uh, you gave us uh, a direction uh, to, on how to spend half of this money, uh, the restricted portion, just to refresh your memory. $42.7 million, roughly half of it uh, had restrictions um, uh, applied to it. It had to be spent within two years of the land sale, which brings us to July of next year, um, and it could not be used for anything to generate revenue. Uh, the other half didn't have those restrictions. And then between the two pots, we had to spend $19 million of it on projects that had a tourism benefit because some of the uh, financing for the funding that we bought that land with was was from bed tax dollars. So with those criteria, we gave you uh, a proposal for the restricted funds. You approved that in December. You approved a change to it last week. Uh, this is what that looks like right now. Uh, the fire department training facility, chaparral pool renovation, and the police training facility. $21.5 million accounts for all the restricted funds. Uh, and it accounts for a small portion of that $19 million tourism requirement. This is uh, what we are suggesting as a possibility, and this is obviously subject to change, your direction, uh, but this would satisfy the $21.2 million for the unrestricted funds. We moved McCormick Stillman from the restricted funds to this one because we can have a project in here that generates revenue which was the reason that we pulled that out of the restricted pile. Um, and we have, um, I think all but one of these projects is identified as a tourism-related project. That brings us to the $19 million target for the tourism projects. Uh, so uh, that is um, our suggestion for the unrestricted portion. Uh, no action tonight, but if uh, you want to give us any direction or suggest any changes, uh, we could certainly uh, take those and uh, and consider them. Well, I will concur with uh, the action you're taking and the recommendation. And at this point, we're down to about 16 months to pay that money, uh, to spend that money in certain allocations. So I, I uh, do believe we're, we're making headed the right direction as recommended. And then the other um, um, item that you asked us to come back to you on in the uh, November presentation was the land sale proceeds from the uh, Museum Square and Fire Station 603 uh, transactions. You can see the total amount, and we've mentioned this uh, a few moments ago, the total sales revenue between the two of those, $20.5 million, and you can see what we allocated it to. Uh, didn't allocate the full amount, uh, but 16.9 for the connectivity initiative, which can be used for Second Street Streetscape or any uh, uh, other things that might fit that, that broad description, and the Stagebrush Theater renovation. And if you remember, we had Stagebrush Theater as one of the tourism-related projects under the unrestricted Bell Road land sale proceeds. If we do that, then that frees up $2.2 million to do something else with here. Uh, and no suggestions. We just wanted to give you the, uh, the, the up-to-date rundown on uh, where that money is, and that's uh, certainly subject to your direction as to, uh, to how we might want to allocate that and spend it. Okay, continue. I don't see any other um, comment. Uh, and then the last couple of slides, uh, just um, going back to the pie chart at the beginning of the presentation, there are other funds that develop uh, a capital program. 
Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the, the larger ones of those. Uh, two slides on the transportation fund. This is the proceeds from the 0.2% sales tax. Um, we go through a very similar project uh, process to the one that I just showed you for general fund. We identify requirements, we prioritize them, um, and we develop a, a cash flow and figure out where that funding cut line is. The funding cut line that we feel we have available for transportation sales tax is $40.9 million. This chart shows those projects that, uh, that come out above the cut line, and the next page will show those projects that, uh, that don't. And of course, this is just a, uh, a first look. There's, uh, there's subject to, uh, uh, to changes, and, and the same things that I described for the general fund apply here. We can change the sequence. If we've got the priority wrong on something, we need to move something up. We can add money. Uh, the most likely source to add money is adding additional one-time funds from the transportation 0.2% uh, operating. We currently move 50% of that every year into capital. Um, we can't spend less than 50% on capital by council policy, but we can certainly spend more. Um, and similar to the general fund, we haven't completed the operating budget analysis and those uh, legislative actions that could curtail our sales tax revenue, they affect transportation sales tax revenue as well as general fund. So there's some unknowns out there that we probably want to get a better handle on before we make any decisions about, about moving those funds. But this is where we stand right now on the transportation. I see Council Member Grant. Thank you, Mayor. Dan, the, um, is, the, is the 2% sales tax, is that temporary or permanent? It's permanent. Okay, and then my other question about that is um, the, uh, that has to be for uh, transportation-related projects, right? The wording of the ballot was uh, transportation improvements, and we have interpreted that to mean capital projects as well as some of our operating expenses. Okay. It uh, funds a large portion of our trolley expenses. Okay. Do you have any, uh, do, are there any examples where bond projects that went over over budget or cost, you know, um, you fill in the gap, make it whole with that sales tax. We uh, have not had transportation projects. Uh, we, we've had them on bond questions, but they haven't been successful since 2000. In 2000, we did use transportation 0.2 percent sales tax revenue to uh, be able to to fund the match for a number of. ALCP projects. Yeah, this was, that was the purpose projects. of this, was ALCP. Um, oh, c continue, sorry. Well, we have used it for bond projects, but that goes, that dates back to 2000. Okay, so you're saying we've yeah. done it before. But there's, 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 there's no example of that happening again, right? It hasn't happened recently just yeah. because we don't have any recent bond-funded transportation projects. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Are you rounding home plate yet? I am rounding home plate. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going into my slide. <laughs> uh, water and wastewater enterprise, uh, the, the bottom line here, they build what they can afford to build based on the money, the, the revenue they collect. It's an enterprise fund. Uh, 47 projects, $162 million. If you want details on that, I'm sure Brian will be able to provide them when he talks to you about rates. Airport enterprise, similar. Uh, the good thing about the airport and enterprise is they're only paying 10 percent of their capital costs. They're leveraging significant amounts of federal funding uh, available through the FAA. Um, and then last slide, solid waste fund, another enterprise fund. Uh, you already heard Sonia mention the $25 million we anticipate issuing in bonds for a future transfer station expansion. It's going to provide revenue generation for us and more convenience for our residents. Um, the fleet fund. Uh, I mentioned briefly um, moving some equipment expenses into the uh, CIP. We're doing that with the fleet fund. doesn't show up. It's not general fund. didn't show up in those slides. But uh, we're taking $18 million worth of purchases out of operating and putting them into CIP, uh, buying most of the wheeled vehicles and equipment that we use, fits the definition of a capital project, has a long lifespan, uh, the thresh exceeds the threshold of $50,000 uh, per unit. So it fits the definition. Uh, the problem we've been having with carrying it in the operating budget is that we're getting 18-month lead times, 24-month lead times, and if you can't get a 
vehicle delivered in 24 months, you can't get delivered in the year that it's budgeted. We gotta rebudget it, roll over that funding authority into the next year. It's a mess uh, to try to track all that. If we move it into capital, it allows us to work more um, uh, conveniently with that uh, uh, long lead time that we're getting with all these purchases now. So it's out of operating into capital, no net increase. So that's all I have, and I would uh, be happy to address any questions that I haven't already. Sure. I see uh, Councilmember Graham and then Councilwoman Janik. Um, I hope my colleagues aren't annoyed with me too much yet with all my questions. So thank you, Mayor. Good. My question, um, <laughs> I did have another question. Um, for the uh, 68th Street sidewalk, Dan, from Arizona Canal to Camelback, it, is that, um, so I, I, I like that idea. I like that project a lot. Do the residents there support that? Have you done outreach for things like that? Uh, we actually, we, we know that there is an organized group that's very strongly in favor of it. Okay. Uh, we have approached people who live along that corridor, in particular people uh, who, um, in some cases, um, they're encroaching into the right of way that, uh, that we'd be building on and notified them. Uh, I think one of them was here defending their oleander bushes at a uh, <laughs> council meeting six months ago. Uh, so there's some awareness. We're hearing a uh, very positive general consensus on, on doing that project. Yeah, okay, very good. I'm, I'm excited about that. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Janik. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in general, I think my comments would be, when you give us these numbers, you need to give us a setting. We need to know how much initially, how much over, I would like to know if it's because of mission creep, inflation, et cetera, because when you keep going over your budget, you know, on certain issues, I think you really need to examine it. I personally, when I look at my budget, if I'm over, things get cut. So I expect nothing less from the city. And I understand what the mayor said about, we don't want to take shortcuts, we always do the best. I want to give you an example that's counter to what you said. They put, knee replacements in 90-year-olds that were meant for 25-year-old athletes. That is a mismatch. And I want to make sure that we are not mismatching. Yes, you want to do the best, but the best has to be a reasonable best. So I would hope that when we look at these projects, if it is something that should last for 10 years, we don't spend three times the money and go for 50 years because that is not a reasonable approach. So I would hope that some of that would be involved in the decisions as well. Thank you. Okay, Councilwoman Caputi. Dan, you've done a really great job. I just want to point out that, you know, it's been a couple people made the comment about this is, this is a really big wish list. We have huge amounts of needs. And um, I think there was a comment about we need to make sure that we generate the revenue to actually pay for our wish list. So I just want to reiterate, I think it's interesting that we had the presentation about um, our financial situation first, and then we go on to talk about all the things that we want to pay for. And it's really important to remember that these things get paid for by um, sales tax revenue, which our city treasurer pointed out to us is a vast majority of our general fund. So economic development is super important. And you also mentioned that 50% uh, of the capital improvement projects are paid for by construction sales tax revenue. So another key component, is that correct, of how we actually- It's 50% of the construction sales tax revenue that the city takes in goes, goes to towards, CIP. Right, goes, it, goes it, towards it, our- It falls far short of what our actual CIP needs are, but, uh, but that is steady income course. that we can project. Yeah, and you know, we do have to try to find sources to pay for it, and I, I think those are important things to keep in mind. Can't turn off spigots on one side and turn them on on the other. So, uh, nicely done, thank you. Well, we are concluded, I believe. Uh, are there any other comments? At this point, I would like a, a motion to adjourn. Motion. Mo second. Move a second. Please record your vote. Thank you. Unanimous. Good night, all. Good night.